going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Vile Files Going Deeper Edition and our 500th episode. How about that? Yay! Woo! <laughs> I was going to say, it's not just another episode. Yeah. I'm glad we clapped. Uh, <laughs> I asked for my own applause. <laughs> nice. Nice. Well, I just want to say, just for starters, I mean, obviously, 500 is... Uh, it's a big number. Um, I can't thank, first and foremost, obviously, all the people listening. If you've ever even listened to one episode, thank you. Uh, without the people who listen to this episode, the show wouldn't exist. It truly is uh, one of the most meaningful things, uh, This, you know, making the show, creating the show, building the show, all the people who've been a part of it. It's It's been such a blessing and so fun to to bring to y'all every week. I think the most exciting thing for me is I truly believe that this show's you know, only getting started. And I feel like we continue to try to make improvements, at least that you guys can hopefully enjoy and listen to. And it's been so fun. So thank you, everyone who's ever listened, uh, whether it's the Ask Nicks or the recaps or our interviews. It's it's so much fun. And um, like I said, just been really, really meaningful. So so thank you, dear listeners. I appreciate it. And then uh, how many episodes, ladies, have you been a part of, do you think? No. I think we came on in the 200s. I can look it up. We've seen... Because it was Nikki Glazer's batch recap was our first ever episode. You're correct. That, that was your first ever episode? I was in Mexico. I logged in online. <laughs> you didn't even show up for your first day on the job? Hey, <laughs> let's let's just give context here. Typically, when you get a job, they're like, great, start in two weeks. You and Byron said, start tomorrow. And I said, I have a vacation booked. I'm so sorry. Do I have to cancel it? And you said no. How nice. Okay, so me. episode 219. 219. I believe. Wow. More so than half. More than half. Let's give it up. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Another round of applause, Another round of everybody. Applause. <laughs> well, I've already said this to you, ladies. Uh, you two have been such a, a, a great value add to this show. And I, I really think that uh, you guys have been uh, a big part of our success. And I've always kind of envisioned the show being what it is today, kind of this format and this atmosphere and style. And uh, it's been a pleasure working with you ladies. So I hope for 500 more with you both. Oh, um, we're going to be so old. And then I'll fire you. No, <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. I will bring the book. I have it in writing. <laughs> yeah, be saying I'd never fire you. Yeah. What I will Which, by the way, is a running joke because from like day one, Allie like walks yeah. around like she's always going to get fired and she's an incredibly reliable <laughs> employee. Yeah, that has been a joke since literally day one. Yeah, it's a... Uh, yeah. Anyway. Good times. Playful. Just a bit of fun. Just playful, <laughs> like threatening the fire. You know. <laughs> <laughs> just cute, fun, flirty. It's cute, fun, you know, <laughs> toxic. <laughs> we love a work workplace dynamic. You were going to say something? Well, yeah. I Well, then I was like, I don't know. Is that, is it weird to be like, you're like the things I appreciate, appreciate about you as a boss? Or, <laughs> and I know if I was going to say it, I should have just gone in confidently <laughs> and not make you ask for it. But I was just going to say, one thing I really appreciate about you is that I feel like you never overpromise or underdeliver. Like you're someone who's like genuinely like, like you say, everybody thinks they're loyal. Genuinely, every single person as a matchmaker, every person I interview says they're loyal. You are truly like one of the most loyal people I know. And I think you are very good about like seeing uh, a future that takes into account everyone's like wants and ambitions and thinking about a realistic um, way to go about that. And I think you like communicate with a lot of integrity and I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for saying. Allie? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'll take my leave. Uh, um, no, I was just thinking she's about like, the Let me go throw up first. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was thinking the other day about when I uh, worked in Chicago and how I was having mental breakdowns every day and losing hair at, in clumps. And I was like, well, I, I haven't done that so far in this job. So thank you. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> no hair loss on the vile files. <laughs> okay. Well, there we go. There we go. Well, <laughs> what a positive spin. Um, well, we have hopefully a great episode for you. Uh, Bartis, Nancy, and Raven from Love is Blind season three are, are all with us. Uh, so we'll get to them later in the episode. A couple uh, housekeeping things. Our third installment of our update show uh, from everything to Ask Nick's to texting office hours is this Friday. So or tomorrow, rather. Uh, mm -hmm. So be sure to check that out. Uh, we love that you guys are loving it, and we're still figuring out what exactly we're going to do long term with that format. But uh, rest it's assured, we'll do something. Look for for uh, 
2023 in terms of some making decisions. We are going to we'll pop off permanently do with the, the recap show. But um, yeah, it, uh, uh, installment three is uh, on Friday. Uh, also, we have uh, Jason Nash next week uh, for going deeper. And Jason Nash and I, in addition to talking about all things pop culture and Jason, super funny guy, uh, really like Jason. Uh, we also, I believe, are going to be having Kanika uh, Batra. I don't know how to pronounce her last name, but she's the one on TikTok. If you've been on TikTok recently, who starts every TikTok by saying, I'm a diagnosed sociopath. And so we'll be talking to a sociopath. That's uh, fun. Next uh, week on Going Deeper. I've, I've just been, I've been seeing her on TikTok. It's just quite fascinating. And I also find fascinating people's reactions because uh, they're critiquing some of the things like she's saying. She's like, she starts every post by saying she's a diagnosed sociopath duh like what do, yeah <laughs> she's pretty transparent like i'm a sociopath and then people are critiquing her like but you that's so like psychotic is that not just like tiktok <laughs> so, slash society in general though like people are just like anything they can comment or tear down it's like she's saying she's a sociopath <laughs> i'm cur- anyway it should be a fascinating discussion uh join us next week for that um all right well we have a lot to get into let's uh let's dive in to episode 500 and also like nan i guess yeah nancy nancy uh, bartis and and raven are our guests but in terms of in-studio guests we just wanted to keep it to ali amanda and myself to celebrate 500 with all of hey, you yo. and, yes. and an us. intimate wedding <laughs> an, an intimate moment the courthouse. So. <laughs> anyway well let's get into it Speaking of intimate wedding and courthouse, uh, Miss Ooh. Argentina and Miss Puerto Rico, uh, Mariana Valera and Fabiola Valentina are married. married. They're married. married. So much for, applause. There's Okay, there's so much to say here. First of all, the fact that they effectively kept it secret as like international Two international beauty, beauty stars. Yeah. yeah, like so impressive. And also like what a lovely bit of representation no. uh to experience i do you think i want to i'm just thinking if they ever have a baby i want like a tiny little baby sash like think how cute that would be or if they did the pregnancy announcement like little miss something with the baby crown I'm, wouldn't that be I'm cute all for it. yeah be, oh yeah totally great. it's a baby sash it, it seems like uh yeah, in terms of representation, like i feel <laughs> like the lgbtq plus community doesn't um have a lot of representation in the beauty pageant community. Mm, totally. You know, I feel like it's... That uh, we know of, yeah. That we know of, yeah. right? In terms of like like the, this hyper-feminized kind of environment um, seems to have more like traditional conservative roots. So I think it's well, some of their really roles. cool that they seem to be kind of, you know, part of that community and showing like, I guess, the, the, the diversity in that community in terms of, you know, it, it's like... It's like when you see like a gay like athlete come out as gay, you know, it's like obviously, of course, gay people play sports, but it kind of goes against the kind of stereotype of of that community. Am I making sense? So I feel like from in terms of representation, it's a great and beautiful thing to see. Totally. I think in terms of like normalizing it, like it's nice to have that happen on a world scale. Um, and I also think kind of like what you were alluding to, or like I think sometimes specifically with like cis women who are queer, like there's an association that they're all like more mask. And so I think having to like hyper femme yeah. um, queer women and like having that visibility is cool but i also think it's like it would be great if we could extend this so it's like let's keep the ball rolling we love that these two like insanely conventionally attractive women are like on the world stage like let's celebrate all the people regardless yeah. of how like atrociously hot they are <laughs> learning a language is good for the soul and good for the brain i really believe that it is such a fun way to like open yourself up to connecting with new people learning about new cultures it's mm. a great way to keep your mind fresh and active and also how fun is it when you go on a trip to actually be able to engage with the locals i think everywhere i've been whenever i try to speak the language people really appreciate it but how are you supposed to learn a language learning languages take a lot of time and commitment babble Babbel's got you covered because they have real native speakers who are teaching you. So none of this like learning from a textbook and then meeting actual people from said place and having no idea what they're saying. Um, it also makes these awesome like 
digestible lessons. You can do a quick 15 minute lesson every single day so you can actually keep track of your language goals because it's not super intimidating. Babbel gives you everything you need. That was great. Yeah. And uh, also, if you're simply just traveling, <laughs> Babbel's great to learn a couple key phrases, to, to speak the native language of the country that you're in. Uh, maybe it's just to help you make a hotel reservation or ask where the nice restaurant is to go eat, things like that, how to get a cab. It's all, I mean, Traveling internationally is so much easier if you just try a little bit to like just say a couple keywords. You will find that the people in the, those respective countries are, will be far more receptive to you if you make some tiny effort to just you know try to speak their language. And Babbel is so great with that. Right now, you can save up to 55% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash V-I-A-L-L. That is babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash V-I-A-L-L for up to 55% off your subscription. Babbel, language for life. Money can't buy you happiness, but the ability not to worry about your money can come close to that. That's where Chime can help you smile more. They were just named the number one most loved banking app with payday up to two days early and fee-free overdrafts up to $200. They offer financial peace of mind in your wallet. All of this with no annual fees, large security deposits, or credit checks to apply. A payday two days early, that can be very influential. If you have, if you need to pay back a friend, if you're trying to buy a flight home for the holidays, you need that cash now. Get it. You earned it. To see for yourself why Chimes is so loved at Chime.com slash V-I-A-L-L. That is Chime.com slash V-I-A-L-L. Chime is a financial technology company, not a bank. Banking services and debit card provided by the Bancorp Bank or Stride Bank, NA, members, FDIC. Early access to direct deposit funds depends on payer. Spot me eligibility requirements and overdraft limits apply. See chime.com slash spot me. Chime was the number one most downloaded banking app in the U.S. according to Aptopia. Speaking of atrociously hot, sexiest man alive. Named. Chris Evans, yeah. Chris Evans. What a Does win anybody friend. else oh. confuse he, he Chris does. Evans and Chris Pine all the time? No, 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 no. no. Just no. the names. Well, they are both named Chris. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry. I never commu- confuse you with Amanda I, Bynes. I feel like you, yeah. <laughs> I thought I was Amanda Bynes when I was a child. I was really, I, she resonated like with me a lot because of she's the man. Yeah, I was a soccer player. 13 is my like, lucky number. Yeah. I feel like, yeah, a lot of young women probably did back in the day. The Amanda yeah. show. Identifying like similar to her is different than like, I thought I was I, okay, Amanda I did Bynes. not think I was, I was not <laughs> a child. I was, I was child. concerned for a second. <laughs> as a teenager. Yeah. I thought I was Zach Morris. Yeah. You know, I certainly wanted to be. Also, can I just say She's the Man? Amazing, amazing movie. Oh my gosh, I just rewatched it. Like we lived, I think we grew up in like the golden age of like rom-coms. Yeah. As my birthday party last year proved, 2004, that era, we had some good stuff coming out. Absolutely spectacular. I think, I don't know if it was the golden era, but I think it was the... The last hurrah. Like she's the man, a Cinderella story. There have been some good ones before your your time. Oh, it well, just I'm you sure. just they just yeah. kind of stopped making it after your time. Yeah, yeah. Bring it back. Uh, yeah. Just to for context, in two thousand four, the sexiest man alive was Jude Law. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I don't know. <laughs> He's Not an really. objectively beautiful that guy. Really got <laughs> she's cackling. I love it. <laughs> I don't know is this a so slight funny. against Jude? I've no. always had a man crush on Jude Oh my God, no. Law. Him in the holiday? Jesus Christ. Like, when he put on those glasses? Yeah. I don't know or why I'm Elfie? crying. Yeah. In what? Okay. Elfie, the movie Elfie? Good movie. I don't um, know Mary Fuck Kill, the most uh, recent sexiest men alive. So Chris Evans, Paul Rudd, Michael B. Jordan. I don't understand the Paul Rudd fascination, if I'm being honest. What's not to like about it's, Paul I think Rudd? It's, it's Ted Lasso vibes. Like, I know that's Jason Sudeikis, but yeah. it's like this idea of like this guy who's very like earnest and nice yeah. and kind and like I guess. And you've heard, purely good. And you've heard, at least I've heard, and I feel like that's, he's, he's, that's his, this is who Paul Rudd is. You know, he's this affable in real life. And, you know, it's, I think people just appreciate his genuinely good nature. Yeah. You know, and his. Like authenticity. See, that's why yeah, I like Chris Evans. He's a superstar who's like, seems practical and down to earth like I think like a Chris Evans like has who, that vibe. like you've seen the video footage of Chris Evans bringing like Betty White up to the stage and Regina yes. King up to the stage it's a gentleman he's it's just ugh, pure heart he seems like a really genuinely good guy yeah, yeah. an amazing Massachusetts representation yeah very likable very likable so Mary fuck kill those three Nick I don't want to kill anyone I think you have to marry Paul 
just because. See, I would marry Chris. Especially after that clip about him talking about what he wants in a partner. Who, Paul Rudd or Chris? Chris. Oh. Well, I only just because like, and I'm, this is not to slight Chris Evans because I would include myself as someone who like has never been married. And, and I don't think that like knocks me as someone who's potentially a really great partner. That being said, like we have more data on, on Paul Rudd in terms of like his desire to want to be in a committed relationship. And, you know, and, and I don't know what, you know, I don't know a lot about Chris Evans dating history. I feel bad for Chris Evans. Why? Because I, I believe that he genuinely wants to find someone. And I bet dating's a real struggle for him. I mean, that's a lot to live up to, to be thought of as this perfect person. You know, it's like the Rodney effect, what we were talking about on the recap. It's mm -hmm. like it's hard to date Jesus yeah, kind of thing. It's hard to live up the expectations of Jesus. And I don't think Chris Evans probably even, you know what I'm saying? I just think it's a, probably a challenge. You know, totally. and I think anytime you might be in a relationship, it 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 must feel it just might it, it must feel like a challenge internally. And I don't know if he struggles with that or at all, but I I I I could see it just being a challenge. You know, totally. And I think that kind of in the Selena Gomez documentary, My Mind and Me, I think that was something that was so apparent in it was like just how isolated people can be, where she's like surrounded by the same yeah. select group of people at any given time, or she's being like bombarded with like paparazzi or strangers, and just like seeing how like lonely and isolating that is. Selena no. and Chris had dating rumors too. Did they? Mm hmm. Hmm. No, I totally, I totally empathized with Selena uh, watching her documentary. And for that same reason, because I think I, we love to compare, you know, and we love to talk about and discuss people's rights to like feeling sorry for themselves sometimes, we, you know, and it's all perspective. It's, it's all a matter of like all objectivity too, you know, like Selena Gomez's whole life has been in front of the you know, in front of the camera, mm -hmm. has been on center stage, and a lot of blessings have come with that, obviously. But, you know, I we forget sometimes that these people are human. I think that's the that's the thing more than anything. It's like we truly don't even see them as humans. I think sometimes the reason why we, we will lose our mind and get so excited is because we see them kind of ab above the fray, like these deities. And they are human, and they have these struggles and these insecurities. And, you know, I think sometimes we you know, want to feel sorry for ourselves or we want to just, we want people to empathize with us. And I think, you know, again, it's not to say that they aren't all, they don't have these blessed lives and I'm not like, oh, poor them. It's just, I think it's a good reminder that we just never really know what people might be struggling with. And we, we shouldn't see people's blessings as an excuse not to have empathy for what they may or may not be struggling with. We just never really know what any one person is dealing with at any given time. And I think Selena really showed that through the documentary and, and talking about and being so vulnerable with her struggles and, even at, in, and facing criticism for that. You know, now you have people like picking apart little things about the documentary or picking apart her friend Raquel. I thought that was Ooh, really yeah. interesting. People are divided. What did you think about the scene where Selena literally is like, Raquel, do you think I'm complaining about my job or do you think I'm complaining about my life because she didn't want to go to the birthday party? From my understanding, her friend Raquel is like a producer on this documentary, so she's clearly a part of it. It seems like she had like some creative input, and she obviously was okay with what is shown. I think uh, I think having a great friend is having friends who are able to truly be honest with you, even when it means having those tough conversations. And I took those scenes as Selena and Raquel like showing that glimpse of this friendship this friendship that isn't about having yes men and having a bunch of like cheerleaders. I'm sure like, you know, friends, you need friends to be your cheerleaders, but like you also my, need them to challenge you, you need them to challenge mm -hmm. you and check you. And I can imagine the struggle that is being someone in Selena Gomez's shoes or any celebrity shoes to be able to find people who can really check you, you know, and, and do it in a healthy and productive way. Someone who can hold you accountable because it must be hard to find that. And it must be hard to like, imagine being someone famous, you're, you're being famous your whole life and everyone wants to kiss your ass and everyone's so afraid of disappointing you for fear that you will shun them outside of your circle. And then imagine how, how do you challenge yourself to want that in your life? I mean, you, it's, well, 
Yeah, it's, uh, sorry. But Selena did an interview when she was younger about that exact phenomenon, especially when she was literally a child. And she was saying she would go to set and everyone on the team would be like, oh my gosh, you're perfect. You're great. Like, do that again. You're fabulous, Selena. You, hyping up her ego so that she would perform. Obviously, she's a little kid. And then she would go home and she said her mom would say, no, you're not perfect. You still have to do the dishes. You still have to do X, Y, and Z. But that's a really hard juxtaposition to have so, as a little kid. So hard. Yeah. So I give a lot of credit to to Selena for that because I'm someone who values having my truest friends or people can be honest with me and people who consider me a friend to them know that that comes with like, I'm not here to, cr to criticize, but if I will be, I'll just, I'm going to be honest with my friends, you know, um, I'm going to be, you know, I want to be empathetic, but I want to be honest. And so I, I think Raquel, her friend Raquel is getting unfairly criticized for what clearly Selena and Raquel wanted to show about their friendship in terms of the value that they they bring to each other's lives and it seems like some of her fans don't like that that she calls her out calls her or just has a critique I didn't think it was mean it just came from a place of honesty and that's the thing you know you can disagree you have a conversation you know and it doesn't mean Raquel was always right it just means that's what friends real friends are there for to be able to respectively and politely hold each other accountable and work through issues. And that's what they showed. And I don't get why some people are jumping all over it. I think for me, the thing that was maybe lacking, and this is not just from Raquel, like I think this was from everyone, is like I would have really liked to see people like just like validate and acknowledge what she was saying. Because I think people were probably like they were respecting it and they were understanding it, maybe being empathetic within like their own headspace and trying to be like, oh, how do we make the show must go on, et cetera. But like, I think it would have gone a long, a long way just to like acknowledge like just they were and say something other than like glam in 30 minutes, like just like really like take a moment to just like let her like sit with that as opposed to it being this thing that is like continually like a dialogue with herself as opposed to something where she can like talk to people. I also thought it was kind of crazy that like there wasn't anybody who was like like a nurse who traveled with her like when she's dealing with like a very serious like illness. Yeah. Like I was just very surprised by that. Also, I'm a huge idiot. They were not married. Chris Evans and Jenny Slate were not married. Oh. Okay. That's okay. We'll keep that all in. I don't think you're an idiot. You're not. I didn't even know. She was married together, and, and so. then she dated someone right after him and I was like, it was him. It was mm -hmm. not him. Okay. Don't, for all the Chris Evans stands out there coming for you. I feel like they've- Delete your it, comments. Delete your comment. <laughs> delete, delete, delete your comment. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, I also decided that um, I, Harry Styles still- number one dream guest, obviously. But I'm going to put Selena Gomez up there for an ass Nick. I do like, and, and when she was talking about, give, she was giving these interviews and you could, and she expressed her frustration of people not listening to what she had to say and like really even thinking about her opinion. I think Selena Gomez would be excellent in an ass Nick. And I would love for her to help us offer people like relationship advice and perspective on any of these calls. So if you're out there, Selena, and you happen to be listening to this, we'd love to have you on. We won't make you sit in front of a creepy mirror, like a literal episode of Black Mirror. <laughs> that was odd. Yeah. And like We'd love to have your input on uh, on, on all things uh, relationship advice and, and answering people's uh, questions. So... Maybe just let Selena know that we are interested in having her on if you're out there. Um, I used to be we, the biggest we only shoot high. Selena Gomez fan to the point where I made like a, um, what is it? Like the, like a Mod Podge thing. Oh, you a know, collage? Like the glue. Yeah, like a giant. I had like all these like oh, teen. Oh, a vision board? No, like it was like I had a bunch of like teen magazines and I would I cut out all the Selenas and I made a giant collage of Selena Gomez because I was so in love with her. So Selena, if you come, I'll ask my parents if they still have it and I'll bring it to you. <laughs> and we'll promise Allie will be normal. <laughs> She'll be. God damn it. I did. I did. I did DM Harry Styles for the 500th episode. I was like, hey. I hear you're in Why town. Not show, your shot. Mary. show your, your shot. shot. And one of these days we're going to we'll we'll get a we'll get one of these dream guests. I know we're real, I mean we're we're aiming for yeah. some we, of the biggest superstars in the world. If we get Selena Gomez, I would love either at the same time or separate interviews if she could make a connection to Steve Martin and Martin Short. I think they would be let's some just, of my dreams. Let's just try 
Why, Thought we were shooting we, our shots. <laughs> Thought we were dreaming big. Let's get Selena Gomez on so we can ask her if she can make an introduction. I like let's the three use Selena of them. Gomez. Let's let's use <laughs> Selena Gomez. I just like their dynamic. I think, I think you two could keep each other company bickering for for years and years and years to come. <laughs> That's why we're Put so good. Put us in at, front of the mirror. We'll yeah. just go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, I really enjoyed the documentary. She, if nothing else, Selena seems like she's just a really genuine person. She has, yeah. I, I believe she had a, she has a genuine desire to be good, mm-hmm. and not everyone has that. I think she honestly puts genuine thought into trying to do the right thing, and I think that is something that's often overlooked. I think character matters to her. Doesn't mean she's a perfect person. Doesn't mean she's without mis- you know without making mistakes, but. I don't think people act. I think most of us don't value character these days. And I think we are so easy to criticize other people for things they say or do, et cetera, et cetera. And I think nowadays we are not thinking about character. And like we've talked about before, you know, what you do when other people aren't looking or aren't judging you and things like that. And I think she has a genuine desire, you know, not just to do these things for performative reasons, but for actual. It's an actual desire of hers. Yeah, like you saw with like the mental, with emotional intelligence and like developing a curriculum for that. Like I, seeing that, I was like, oh my God, why don't we have that? Like put that there with like taxes and managing like basic personal finances. Like Ugh. why is this not taught in school? Like I was really lucky at my university. I took a class on emotional intelligence um, and it was a really good, insightful course. And like she makes such a good point. Like you start learning emotions when you're in kindergarten and like, Why do we just have this like huge cutoff period and expect people to know, especially like I think especially like men where maybe there's like it's a bit more stigmatized or they're not always given that same space to like be emotional or like they're socialized to not go there as much. Like I really think this is something all people should have access to is just like Mm -hmm. resources to better understand themselves. Also, when she was talking to the women in Kenya, I was like, can they lead a course or something? Because some of the stuff that they were saying, like, I can't put the I can't build the roof until I have a foundation. They were talking about how they need to like work on them themselves and get their education first before like thinking about these other things <laughs> i was I, imp- so impressed i really enjoyed the documentary yeah. yeah good doc yeah up next bartice nancy and raven from love is blind and then after we uh hear from them we'll uh give our thoughts on the love is blind reunion and the finale mostly talk about how toxic zen and cole are with each other and then we'll do some texting office hours and that will be our 500th episode once again, can't thank you guys enough. Also, oh, do we have an update on uh, book clubs? Book club stuff. Yeah, if you're interested in joining a Don't Text Your Ex Happy Birthday book club, which is you know part book club, part just dating support, support group, group in your area, you don't even really have to have read the book to join or find a community. We highly recommend it because in in the support groups, people will be trying to hold support and hold each other accountable for setting expectations and defining boundaries with yourself and and. And encourage people to do that because it's so hard to do in practice. So we we highly encourage you to get the book. But it is not a requirement. Yeah. But you can go to our Vile Files Instagram. We have all the links to the book club saved under highlights for our stories. Or you can just go directly to Facebook and search DTYEHB book club dash any of the following cities. Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco, Phoenix, Dallas, Columbus, Boston, Sacramento, Denver, New York City, Toronto, Philadelphia, Austin, Atlanta, Vancouver, Seattle, and uh, the rest are in progress. So mm-hmm. and if you're, if you're new to those areas, maybe you're new to the city, maybe join those clubs, maybe we meet some friends. Totally. You know, maybe you'll get a date out of it. I don't know. Oh. oh. <laughs> who, oh. who knows? Oh. Who knows? Let's get to Bartice. When it comes to choosing a wireless plan, you're forced to compromise. But what if you didn't have to? What if you could get reliable service without a contract and save money? Introducing Total by Verizon, a new no contract, no credit check carrier for you and your family with plans starting at just $30 per month on America's most reliable 5G network. Sacrifice nothing, experience everything. Total by Verizon is available at totalbyverizon.com and at retailers nationwide. Based on first place rankings and Root Metrics first half 2022 5G assessments of 125 metros. Experiences vary, not an endorsement. Do you guys like robes? Are you robe people? I wore a robe 
last evening. Oh, oh, nice. Well, if you haven't tried on a Brownlee robe, you haven't really tried on a robe. Natalie and I have recently collabed with Brownlee, and uh, it's been a really fun experience. It's our first uh, collab as a couple. It's my, I think it's my first like collab collab at all. Wait, that's gorgeous. That's beautiful. Yeah, I think so. It's just Comfy, a really cozy, next step in sexy. our relationship <laughs> too, you know? Yeah. Their, ro- their robes are amazing. And what I love about them is because like, I feel like with most, with robes you have one or two choices. You have like the kind of like really light kind of like not functional robe that like looks Yeah, like the kimono The silky moment. kind of, you know, whatever. Or like a heavy kind of like and then you're Owl. doing your makeup in it and you're sweating because it's keeping all of your body heat yeah. in. The brownie ones are really light and they like lay on your body and they kind of have that kind of fashionable, I don't know, they're really, I don't know, they're nice, but they you're also are You're selling it, Nick. Warm. No need to say more. And they lay on your body. Brownlee has created an exclusive capsule collection of French terry robes in four colors with myself and Natalie. And uh, it's been super fun. And we call it our, the Back to Brooklyn line because that's how Natalie and I met. Get your him and her robes for you and your partner or just get it for yourself. For the holidays? For what the a holidays? great gift. Yeah. His and hers? I first his get it for his, yourself first, hers. ladies out there. I tr- Promise me when I say you will love these robes. They're, if, you, if you're a robe person, you need a Brownlee robe. Brownlee.co, B-R-O-W-N-L-E-E.co. Use code N and and one five. That's N, N and symbol. Like but, an M, like an M M&M, and M, but, but N and N and N and one five to save. Bertiz, thanks for joining. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, glad to, glad to be with you. How you been? How's your heart? How's my heart? Yeah, <laughs> my heart's full, man. It's been crazy uh, last few weeks with the show airing and everybody seeing and everybody reaching out. So okay. feeling happy, feeling full. All right, awesome. Well, we have a few questions uh, for you. Our, our time, I know, is limited, so we just wanted to kick it off. Uh, I guess I just wanted to start by asking you, like, what is your I guess, what is your take on your experience? Like, especially having watched it back, because obviously yeah. filming it's one experience, watching it back is an experience. How do you yeah. see it? I, I'll just like open-ended question. How do you see your experience? So I'll say this. So you're exactly right. Living through it was one thing and then watching it back it was completely different. I think for me, watching it back, I definitely learned more than, than living through it. I think I felt like I was learning when I was living through it, but not until I was able to see like what I was doing, what I was saying, and how I was impacting the people that I love, specifically Nancy. And seeing myself do that was like, it was eye-opening. Um, I'm, I mean, the initial emotions, I guess, I was feeling watching it back, like here on this TV, I was on my floor rolling around. It's like, oh my God, what am I doing? What am I saying? Most times, you know, for the first... I think six or seven episodes, I was like embarrassed. What, um, what specifically then, were you embarrassed about? I think mostly just my, my brutal honesty and my lack of kind of understanding that what I'm saying and what I'm relaying, the information needs to be relayed to Nancy, but not the way that I did it. And not how like how much I deeply dived into the whole Raven conversation or the pool conversation or the or in bed with Nancy talking about, you know, what happened at the pool. Um, so I think... You know, on one hand, there's a sense of shame and a sense of embarrassment, but also I would never have lied. And I wanted to be as honest and open with Nancy because she needed to make a decision on who I am for herself at the altar. Sure. And so I would have, I would have wanted Nancy, and she was always honest with me. I'm not saying she'd lie, but I would always want somebody to be honest as opposed to being like fake or lying. Where do you think you cross the line, I guess, between yeah. being honest versus, you know, putting yourself in Nancy's shoes or being empathetic yeah. and right. and thinking to myself, if I were Nancy, this would be really hard for me to hear. Like it would be hard for me. I'm assuming it would be hard for you to hear if yes. Nancy was just like, I don't know, man, me and Cole together, we look good together. People get us, you know, things <laughs> like this. Like how, right. how would you have done it differently if you could I, go okay, back in so, time? Yeah. Number one, you're exactly right. I would have felt I would have felt much worse if I, if Nancy had said this to me, than I felt watching myself do it. Like I made, I, I, I felt so bad watching it back and just hearing myself go into detail. And I think that's where I draw the line. the The extent of where I went with with the information and like even reenacting a scene in, in bed together that was way too far. So I think what I would do differently is say, hey, hey, babe, you know, this is. A, this is a struggle for me and here's where I'm at. I don't need to go into all the, the details and all the names that I was calling everybody. Did Nancy ask you first or did you open up about like the physical aspect of, of Raven? Like how did that conversation even get started? 
Oh, shoot, man. I don't know. Another thing I'll say, don't have these conversations. I would not have these conversations drunkenly between the hours of midnight and 4 a.m. So that's one thing. I, I can't oh, remember were, who brought okay. it up. You were drinking while you guys were having these conversations? Oh, you couldn't tell my eyes, man? My eyes were like this the whole time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we just we were, met. We just met. <laughs> true, true. Um, no, I, I don't remember who brought it up, but I remember she had said something like, you know, I talked with SK today. He's not my type. So it's like, uh, it's a no for me. Um, and I was like, oh, well, I talked to Raven. I had the opposite experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, it's so it seems like you're kind of alluding to the fact that like there was a strong emotional connection with Nancy, but the attraction wasn't there. And in watching the show, it seemed like maybe that became apparent to you when you saw Raven. It was kind of like, would you say it was seeing other options that kind of caused you to really question the degree to which you were attracted to Nancy? Or was it something you'd been grappling with since you first saw her? I think it was just like a kind of a snap back to reality or like a... Uh a realization that the real world is going to bring struggles that we did not feel in the pods when I developed those emotional connections and that feeling for Nancy, that love. Um, because, you know, we, we say this on the show when we're going through it, like, holy shit, this is a fairy tale, right? This is, this is this environment uh, in the pods and in Malibu and love is blind. Those first 10 to 15 days, it's like, it's geared towards falling in love. Um, and I, so I think, you know, seeing all the girls, seeing everybody out in, in public, seeing any girl, I was just like, Whoa, this is, this is the real world. I'm no longer in this fairy tale where it's just easy to kind of open up and, and have somebody fall in love with who I am on the inside and, and do that to Nancy. So seeing all the girls, Raven in particular, yeah, sure, it was like a snap back to reality. Interesting. Um, what you On the show, I thought, just for everyone, everyone kind of always, you guys, you, you, you guys like to talk about how in love you guys were with each other. And even after a fight, you'd be like, oh, but we love each other and things like that. Yeah. But I'm, I'm curious, like, what does love mean to you? Because, you know, we're on this show a lot. We talk about people saying the word, but like often don't talk about what's behind the word. And I'm just curious, what does being in love mean to you? And has that answer changed for you between when you first went on the show versus now going through that kind of very intense social experiment? When I first went on the show, and I think you'll hear about me and Nancy agreed on this like wholeheartedly. And that's one of the things we connected on the pods when we talk about love or falling in love. You heard, you heard the term best friend all the time, comfortable all the time. And with Nancy, I think you see me and her have these difficult conversations that I felt comfortable doing. And it was specifically the, the, the looks thing. That was a very hard conversation to have. But since I felt so, I felt like this person was me. I felt like I could say all this stuff to her retroactively. Like in retrospect, that's completely wrong. That's not, how it should be or to an extent, like, I guess I took it too far, but in the moment I was like this, this love I feel for this person, I kind of feel safe showing all this, this side of me, showing my struggle, showing my opinions that are completely different than hers. Um, so when I think about love and I think about a partner at that time, it was just like, who can I, who is this most easy with? Okay. Um, I guess looking back at it now, like, I mean, I still want that comfortability. I still want love to be, easy i know it's not easy um you know with with my obviously my parents love story being a divorce and same with nancy's and then obviously me and nancy you know it, i had to flip a switch midway through to really put in effort um and i didn't feel like love should be should require that much effort because i was so blinded by it i wanted it to be easy i wanted it to be comfortable and natural and that's how i fell in love with nancy and then we get back to dallas and it's just no longer Gotcha. Do you? I mean, so, how do you feel now? Do you feel like love need, requires the effort, or or shouldn't? I think it does. It, it definitely doesn't require no effort. You sure. know, it definitely is not. You definitely have to put some effort in because there's going to be disagreements and arguments and and differences in opinion over time and challenges that you need to work through together. And for the most part, me and Nancy did that. I think we did a good job communicating how we were feeling, and we. She never made me extremely uncomfortable. I'm sure I made her uncomfortable on more than one occasion. Um, but yeah, you definitely need to put effort in if you want something to work. Yeah. Midway, midway through, I don't know if, if you've talked to Nancy about this, but she, I don't, I don't remember this is on camera either, but she basically like told me like, hey, this is, this is not working, Bartiz. Like you need to grow up. You need to try, you need to actually try here. And um, I, you know, I hated saying this when we were going through this. I was saying this both on and off camera, but like the trying thing, the forcing it, when I when I would be like I don't feel like I need to force anything to to be in love. I think I, I was wrong with that. I think Nancy was absolutely right. I think in the t in the short amount of time that we had to quote unquote make it to the altar, make a decision, I needed to force it. 
And so in, in order to know, right, in order to find out, could I, could I spend the rest of my life with this person? And in the middle of our journey, it was just like, I, I was just checked out. Yeah. But then she had that conversation with me and I started to force things. I started to be more physical and like hold her more and kind of give her what she wanted. And then that's when I kind of felt like, quote unquote, back in love with her. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, so like on a scale where like 100 is like, I'm 100% certain we are going to spend our lives together. Like this is my person and zero is like, absolutely not my person. Like how would you, where would you say you were throughout the show um, at various points? Oh man, well, okay. I mean, roller coaster, right? Roller yeah. coaster the whole way. I mean, you, you even see up until my wedding day where I'm having a breakdown. There's still, I'm still like going all over the place. But if I had to put a number on it, like in the, in the pods, 100%, I was like, okay, let's do it. Let's go. Come on for the rest of our lives. Um, Malibu it started to come downhill and then we came back to Dallas for downhill. I'd never so, say it got to zero. It probably, it probably didn't get lower than 20, right? But there were some low points in there. I was like, shit, I don't know if I can do this. And Nancy was the same way. Um, so my low points were definitely more highlighted. Yeah. Um, at the, uh, but, at the altar, Nancy seemed, Nancy was always seemed pretty clear, you know, that she was in it. She was going to, if you were going to say yes, she was going to say yes. Obviously, you ended up saying no. I mean, it seems like Nancy felt like you let her on a little bit. Uh, do you, like, were you really that confused the day of? Like, where did, where, where when you made your decision, and because you seem like a really logical guy to me, like, I, you know, one thing I reckon, empathize with you while watching the show, too, it's just like, you know, I thought it was kind of, an interesting part where you know it seemed like Nancy kind of wanted to get down and dirty and 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 wanted to kind of like hook up and and you were like I got a lot on my mind and I think you know as as a guy I think that's not something that uh, is 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 talked about as much where men aren't always yeah. down to like hook up especially when they're stressed out and so I really empathize with you there too but nevertheless like you seem like a very logical thought through type of guy so I'm just wondering when did you start using that kind of logic and, and, and thought process to get to the decision that you weren't going to say yes to Nat, to Nancy. I mean, there's, so every step of the way along this process, you're collecting information, Yeah. right? Yeah. So even, even in the pause, I was collecting information. Like if you want specific examples, there was when she had described her ex as being a realtor in the pause to me. And then we get to the real world. And, you know, there's a lot more to that story that she's, he's not just a realtor. He was, you know, they own two mortgages together. So she's financially tied to this man. So that just one piece of information is something that I'm logically going to think about, right? Sure, That's going to yeah. weigh on my mind for X amount of days until we get to this ultimate decision. And then we move forward with our process. We move forward with our love story. We get to the altar. We get to wedding day. And sure, I'm like, I could have seen a yes on wedding day and I could have seen a no. Okay. And I think when I really was lo- leaning more towards no, when I was kind of locking on the answer, that's when the gift came. And I don't, and you've seen that obviously, like the whole breakdown and everything. Yeah. And because it was like the most perfect, like thought out gift. And it was just, it was like the embodiment of all of our journey together, all of the good stuff that we've been through, all the little things. Um, and it was, it just was a perfect picture of Nancy. And then that's when I realized, like, holy shit, how can I hurt this perfect girl? And so the gift, I mean, I, I don't remember thinking, looking at the gift like, okay, this is going to make me say yes, or I'm for sure saying no. I just remember being with, look at holding this gift like this is the culmination of the last almost two months of my life. And potentially this woman, and I was looking at this gift like this, this is Nancy, like this is a perfect girl. This could be forever for me. So I had a, I had a freak out panic attack. And then that led me into a spiral and that led me into sending her a gift which is probably where she thought she was being led on because with that note, that's the one thing I regret from this whole experiment is sending that note with that shot that said, let's do the damn thing. Because yes, I, I see how that could be, you know, so leading you somebody on. you weren't planning on sending a gift until she sent one to you? That's right, yeah. That's when, during my spiral, I was like, oh, sh- I got to send her something, you know. And then you said, so, let's do the damn thing, even though, <laughs> yeah. I could see why yeah, she was I, upset. I, let's yeah. do the damn thing, me and the wedding, but, you know, let, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Well, not the wedding. Not, well, let's get there. Let's, let's get to the altar and see what we do. Um, fair enough. <laughs> you know, it takes a lot of confidence for people to own insecurities, right? Uh, I think it's easy to talk about your confidence. I think it's another thing to just own insecurities and be vulnerable. And I think that as you get older, you realize how much t- confidence that takes. I'm curious, what are some of your insecurities? 
And if any of those played a role in the kind of courtship between you and Nancy? Um, I mean, I've, I've always been insecure about talking about my feelings. And I think, like I said early on during this podcast, that comfortability and that ease of being able to do that with Nancy, it, that really helped me fall for her. So, and I'm not even going to call it like emotional vulnerability because I am emotionally vulnerable. Um, just relaying my emotions. I've known that's been a struggle for me in my previous relationships. Even what relationship what about that makes you feel insecure? That, that, a lot of girls don't like that. So why, if I'm not able to do that in a good way, one, I'm going to hurt somebody like I did with Nancy. So you, you don't think a lot of women like to hear someone's feelings? No, I'm saying a lot of women don't like the fact that I cannot share my feelings oh, I in, a, in, a, in a way that makes sense, I okay. guess. Okay. Right. Yeah. I, can't, I can't feel something and say, hey, this is how I'm feeling. Okay. Interesting. All right. Uh, well, I can see how that uh, was a challenge in your experience. Have, do you feel like you're better with, than that, with that now? Uh, I hope I'm better with it. I don't feel like I'm doing what I did on, on Love is Blind anymore. I don't think I'm blatantly, um, like, I don't think I would blatantly be telling my current fiance, not to say I'm engaged right now, I'm single right now, but if I had a fiance, I wouldn't be telling her how attracted somebody else is. Right. Yeah. I would be, in, I would be, because it seemed like hopefully... you were pretty good at expressing your feelings. It's just how you went about it. <laughs> was... That's exactly what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. That's okay. what I'm saying. Gotcha. Uh, and then I guess my final question is like, how, how are things with, was like Nancy's family obviously seems pretty upset at the wedding. Uh, yeah. How did that smooth over, if at all? And did you, did you guys get back on the same page or is there still some animosity between you and, and me her and her family? family? No, yeah. I have not talked to her family at all since the wedding. Actually, her family didn't know that me and Nancy had talked since the wedding either. So they are, you know, I have a younger sister and I could see, I agree with the emotion that they were feeling there. You know, that's their baby girl. That's the, for Steve, that's her big sister. Yeah. I don't agree with how they reacted because um, I, I would not have reacted that way. And how would you say your relationship with, uh, with Nancy is now? Yeah, it, it's continued. It's, it's nothing romantic anymore. She made that very clear at, after, you know, the altar. Um, but we've, we've gone through another roller coaster. Like it's been friends. It's been no communication. It's been disliking each other. It's been acquaintances. I say now we're, we're cordial now. She was just texting me but not too long ago. But it, it's tough because when we try to be friends, you know, there's, and then you start to date other people, it's hard to maintain that friendship with respect to the next person that you're trying to date. Um, and, you know, you can look at like a triangle, right? If it's me and then another girl and then Nancy, I'm not going to be able to keep all those lakes that triangle happy. Whether that be because I'm, not giving Nancy the attention she deserves as a friend or whether I'd whether be I'm keeping Nancy too close and it's making another girl uncomfortable. It's, it's hard to, to manage a relationship like that. All right, man. Any final thoughts you want to share with us? Like what's, what's next for you? What, what do you, what do you, what do you hope for yourself when it comes to love in the future, Bartiz? I think right now I'm, I'm taking it day by day. I think I really, I'm taking the time right now to process, which is what I should have done after filming but like I said, I learned a lot more watching it back than I did going through it. So I think right now I'm just taking it day by day, processing and, and trying to get better as a man for hopefully my future wife one day. All right, buddy. Well, best of luck. We appreciate hey, you taking the time. All right, take can care. I, can oh. I ask one oh. final question? Oh, Allie has a question for you, Bertie. Buzzer okay. Okay. Literally a final one because we had a conversation about this. I think it was last episode when we were talking about Love is Blind. The scene when you were in the bathtub and Nancy started talking about not having a plunger, was that oh, a God. complete turnoff for you in that moment? <laughs> No, I mean, I was not turned <laughs> off by that. I was like, girl, protect yourself. Like, we're, we're not <laughs> naive. There's cameras everywhere. We're like, there are people going to be watching this. I was like, you know what? Just kiss me. Like, just close your mouth and kiss me. Like, let's not embarrass ourselves too much here. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was weird. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But... <laughs> <laughs> That's just me. All right, Bartiz, appreciate you taking the time, man. All right, thanks for having me. All right, take care. take care. Bye-bye. Nancy, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Good to be with you. Uh, we're big fans of you over here. Uh, I'm not sure what the fuck Bertice was thinking, but uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but seriously, but also I'm kidding. How, how are you? How, how are you doing? How's your heart? My heart is healed. Good. But I can't say that, you know, I think going through this experiment from the beginning, you hope for the best, but you really don't know what's going to happen through the pod phase and then into the Malibu phase and then back to Dallas phase. You just don't know how every day could change within your relationship. So at the, um, yeah, at the end of it all, I'm healed. I, I feel like this is the most exciting part of it is getting it, getting to share it with the world. 
Yeah. I have a few questions here, if you can indulge me. I think as a lot of people are fascinated with the kind of the the wedding day, right? The kind of alter moment of the I do's or I don'ts. And I'm curious for you, because you were very kind of vocal throughout the process, but as someone who, were you planning on saying yes at the time? I knew that morning that it was going to be a yes for me. Okay. But it, it was a definite no halfway through. Um, after the group scene and, and his little shenanigans he pulled in front of Andrew, like for me, that was like the hell no. Um, when, when was that part and, again? So it was uh, about halfway through the season when Andrew and like the group got together. We had met up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And Bartiz comes over very macho, you know, wanting to lay his ground. I don't know. Um, but I remember at that night, um, and then we had that conversation in our kitchen where he expresses how much looks matter. Um, yeah. That night is when I like cried myself to sleep to wake up in the morning and say, this is not the person. And, and thankfully, you guys did get to see some of that conversation in our sure. living room the very next day. Um, yeah. So then I think for me, it was like, I'm giving up. Like, I cannot with you. You're not the person that I fell in love with. It just was someone completely different. So it, it was me giving him a second chance to really turn things around the last almost two weeks of our relationship. And he said it, he said it to me at one of our dinners. He said, um, you know, this is the husband that you're going to get, you know, this new Bartis, this like person that, you know, I re fell in love with. Um, and so in my mind, everything he was telling me up leading up until the wedding, the last two weeks was the, we, the, us, the future. Sure. So yeah, the wedding day was, yeah. Well, that's also really interesting. I want to get back to that. But the reason I asked the original question is because I find it really interesting that it seems like, and I'm curious your thoughts on this, all the people who end up saying, I don't or I do not, they all claim that they came up with this decision literally seconds before it came out of their mouths. And yet everyone who says yes always is just like, I, either, I, you know, I knew kind of the days leading up or I knew that morning. And I'm just, as someone who's in your shoes, do you think that's bullshit for the people who ultimately said no on the last final second? Uh, or do you think it's just some magical coincidence that the people who are saying yes, no prior to, but the people who are saying no, have no idea of their truth until the moment, until right, right before it comes out of their mouth? Where, where, how, do you, how do you sit with that? I think in general, the conversation really is it comes down to communication, right? So did you communicate to your partner leading up until the wedding day that you were having doubts? And I think that's where I felt so blindsided is that Bartis, the doubts that he did have on our very last dinner, his conversation with me was, oh, those doubts that I had, you know, I'm going to put those in the past. We are going to move forward. So I think for me, it really comes down to like, what were you communicating your doubts with your partner? Or yeah. did you tell them, hey, everything is fine. And, you know, then send them a shot saying, let's do the damn thing. Um, yeah. That, right before I, the altar. That was, that was a little nuts. I felt like he might have a little contradicted himself because we kind of asked him a similar question when he knew. And it almost seemed like, after you gave him a gift, he had this like he panicked. He panicked. Sent you a shot. Sent you a gift, but almost yesterday when we talked to him, uh, he made it seem like when you he got your gift, almost that like made him question the relationship. Did I understand him? Mm -hmm. That's kind of what he said, yeah. right? What do you What do you have to say about that? Or do you feel like did you even know that? Or do you does that make you feel a little bit more let on by Bartiz? Well, seeing that scene was the first time I had seen it, you know, with yeah. where um, he had mentioned um, that, oh, or, or I forgot who told me that Martise broke down the day of your wedding. I was like, broke down for what? Like, <laughs> like what is he freaking out about? Um, and so honestly, seeing that scene, it, it felt more like, wow, he knew he was going to say no. Yeah. And that presence that I gave him reminded him of the amazing person that he's about to let go of. And so what, what's so interesting, I think even part of that scene was when his dad says, you know, this is something your mom would do. And Bartise from the beginning was like, if it's someone my mom and my abuela, my grandmother would approve of, you know, all these things. So it was like mixed signals because you 
you cry, but what are you crying about? Like, is it, is it because you're, you know that you're about to break my heart yeah. <laughs> at the altar? Yeah, guilt. Um, but then you, yeah. but then you still send me a shot. Let's do the damn thing. Like, I think that's where, I think that's for me where the blindsideness came in on, on, in our relationship. Yeah, totally. I, 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 I have a hard time believing any of, any of the people who said no last second. It just, it seems like they just kind of, what are, what are they going to do? They admit to leading someone on, I, you know what I'm saying? Like, but it, yeah. it seems, seems so hard to believe. And all the people who, who were planning on saying yes, all say that they, you know, they knew they're going to say yes before. It just, it, it doesn't add up for yeah. me. I'm curious. Um, you know, we, we really enjoyed watching you, uh, this whole season, you know, you were very reflective and, and vulnerable and we appreciated that. And I think one thing people are really captivated by with you is, you know, like the loyalty you spoke of that you want in a relationship, you know, especially with like Bartise. And it seemed like you were really committed to, I fell in love with this man in the pod and I made a promise to him. I value what an engagement means. And we, we love that. Right. But we also talk a lot about in this show about, you know, setting boundaries with yourself and setting expectations with your partner and holding them accountable for how people, you know, treat you and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering through this experience, right? Uh, what have you learned about yourself and what have you kind of learned about love and how are you someone going forward going to be going to try to, you know, still capture that loyalty? Because like, I mean, I, I consider myself a very loyal person. It's a, it's, it's a trait that really is important to me. But I also don't think like I think loyalty is very much earned and you have to continue to earn that loyalty with someone. And I'm just wondering for you, do you now feel a little bit more that way as opposed to it seemed like, you know, whether you intended it or not, but you almost kind of like, you know, like shot yourself in the foot almost by like the loyalty that you wanted to give Bartiz and it came from like such a genuine and good place, but almost like it didn't he didn't always deserve that loyalty you were so willing to give mm -hmm. him. You know, because yeah. of how you guys were, you know, the conflict you were having and some of the things he was saying and some of the, you know, things going on in your relationship. And so, like, for yourself, do you, do you, is that, has that changed how, your approach to dating in the future in terms of how do you hold someone accountable for how they take care of the relationship? How do they prioritize the relationship? How do they prioritize you and things like that before you're so willing to kind of give them this unconditional loyalty? Does that make sense? Absolutely. No, I think it's a great question. Uh, I have no regrets from the person that I chose through everything that we went through. I have no regrets about what we did, what I did. However, what, what I will, um, I guess, uh, own up to is that I didn't set boundaries that I should have. And I think watching myself go through that process, like, when I envision marriage, I envision it to be forever. So I envision, you know, even in the healthcare field, you know, when I work with um, adult population um, patients and you see the husband and the wife and you know, if they're going through a recent surgery and like the husband is so everlasting, giving him all, giving their partner all the love and just like this genuine love that lasts forever in my mind. I said, I love you to a 25 year old through a wall. Like that was insane for me. So I think in this experiment, I was really in it with my pure heart. And, and I'm, I'm really glad to hear that you guys, you know, you saw that because that's exactly what it was. Um, however, I think that being that it is an experiment and that I wanted to give it my all, I also never wanted to tell this man who to be and what to do for me. Um, because if I'm going to marry you, I need to see your true colors. Yeah. And if these are your true colors, then I need to decide if I'm going to accept you for that or not. Had Bartiste not turned things around halfway through our relationship and had he not really put our differences aside to just focus on us, definitely we would have had a different outcome at the altar. So I think for me, it was truly living in a world of our love story where I had to do what I needed to do. I needed to be me. I knew where I, where I stood for myself, who I am, and really allowing Bartiz to kind of like, hey, do your thing. And I, I will give you feedback. We will have conversations. We will have disagreements. But I really need to see who you are. And I think for me, that was the best way that I could manage 
such an extremely fast engagement yeah. is I need to see you mad. So like buck up, you know, like I need to see you sad. So like, how is that? Um, and so I, so I think overall what I've learned moving forward and what I've been working on the last year and a half is just really setting boundaries and being able to not only be a good listener, because I think that's something I value about myself is that I am a really good listener. And it's something that I've learned to just really master where, um, I truly want to, hear what you are saying as the other person talking. And so I think we're now moving forward. Um, you know, uh, it's really just taking relationships for what they are. And if something doesn't feel right, um, being able to recognize, recognize that early enough to not necessarily tell someone what to do, because never going to be that person for you to tell you, you know, this is what I need from you. It'll be more of like, Hey, this is what, what I need. And like, leave it up to you to decide if you want to be a role to take to, to to take charge in that yeah area. I love that that's great yeah. yeah uh do you ladies have any questions I was just wondering like trying to get your perspective on you know after the wedding clearly your family went into like full protective mode your brother your mom specifically they wanted to be there for you not only emotionally but physically and I think that was like a point of conflict of Bartise telling them to back away you told them to give them you know give you guys space looking back on that do you think they were in the right were they in the wrong should they have let you and Bartise have your moment the way that my family reacted that day is so powerful to me because I'm I'm I am a quiet little squirrel when it comes to conflict and confrontation like I know how I can be and so I think the fight that I wanted to fight in that moment I could not I could not ever do I don't have the strength for it yeah. so I think my family were really the the warriors that day to just really express what I couldn't express because at that moment my heart was completely shattered I was left at the altar and I knew that I could not like put my words together in that moment to say what I wanted to say. So I think for me, it was absolutely the, the, the most beautiful scene probably in the entire uh, season that um, seeing how strong they fought for, for me mm -hmm. when I couldn't fight for myself. Yeah. Uh, Bertie seemed like someone, you know, like even in the reunion, you know, I give him credit because he seemed open to criticism, you know, and he seemed to be willing to, you know, hold himself accountable for the for the most part. As someone who's his former fiance who, you know, had a very, you know, rather brief but intense relationship with him, what would you like to see from Bertice? You know, like maybe it's not really your problem, but indulge me, but like where do you think he could learn to be the right to be a good partner for his next partner? Like where where do you think there are areas of growth that you would like to see him work on before he dives into his next serious relationship? I think looking back at the season, I watched it the first time and I'm like, you know, oh, okay, I'm watching myself, right? Because I'm like, what did I do? What are my mannerisms? And then the second time I kind of rewatched some some parts, I'm watching it under Bartiz's perspective. I learned a lot about Bartiz through watching the show, you know, watching his side interviews, his side conversation. In my opinion, I think that Bartiz still needs to work on some of that self-love, self-confidence, really know who he is and cherish that, value that. Um, I think that if he could really find that confidence and security within who he is, and I'm talking like the core, not yeah. the extra stuff, right? I think that if Bartiz could get to a place where he really loved himself and knew where he had, where his strengths lied and held on to that love to everyone else and for him to be able to receive love will be will be so amazing but it, it has to start with that love for yourself and like not letting other people's opinions of who your fiance is or what they look like um affect your your beliefs and what you feel inside yeah. um so but but i think it really has to start with that core love for himself and then that will open up doors to be loved by someone else and for him to be able to give love as well yeah. Personally, just so you know, Nancy, we think you look great, by the way. <laughs> we... Thank you. So do I. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, yeah, we asked Bartiz when we talked to him, and I'll ask you the same question to just keep it fair, because I said, you know, I think it takes a lot of confidence for people to like own their insecurities. And I, I was curious what he said, what he thought his own insecurities were. His answer, 
I don't, felt to me like a bit of a, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't love his answer because his, his answer was, uh, I could be a better communicator, which I think I agree. He could be a better communicator. I don't believe that's a true insecurity of his, you know? And I'm just wondering as someone who was able to date him, would you agree or disagree with that? And then I would ask you the same thing. Do you have an insecurity? But you all, yeah, I feel like this would be easier for you to answer because you've been so vulnerable and so real with your strengths and your weaknesses. But I'd love to hear from you about that. I think Bartice was the best communicator he could be in that moment. I don't think that Bartice, I mean, he's never lived with a woman. He had never really, you know, he dated someone, I think, for maybe four years or something, but he was 25. So what, he was like 18 when he started that relationship. So I, I, I don't think that that was his, biggest insecurity in my perspective yeah yeah okay i don't i That's don't fair. buy it <laughs> i didn't either uh, but yeah I, what about you yeah. uh, did, what, what are things that um do you have any insecurities that you'd like to share and if you don't feel comfortable that that's fine i just more I, again like i said i think you know, there's so many people out there listening to this show, too. And I think, you know, we are so afraid to voice our insecurities for fear of people judging us and things like that. But I think sometimes we can just feel a little bit better when we get it out there and and, and feel, make other people feel seen and let, it, let them know that it's, you know, we all struggle with this stuff and it's okay. And we can still be our best selves despite having some insecurities. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um I think when it comes to my insecurities, it's really, I'm too nice. Like, I don't know how else to put it. Like, I'm too nice. I'm too trusting. I've been that way all my life. And I feel like as an adult now where I can learn how to share that love, it really can protect me um, in a way that I've never protected myself before. Um, whether it was a friend who backstabbed me in high school and I still like loved her for it after, right? Um, or worked on a friendship that probably should have been over years ago. So I think, and I don't really know if it's an insecurity or, or weakness, how you would call it. Um, my yeah. therapist, so I've been in therapy um, really since the show, just to really figure out like, where did I go wrong? Like, what could I have done different? Talking through like, what my actions were. And I think at the end of the day, like there's nothing that I want to change about myself. Like there's nothing that I, I am insecure about that. I'm like, Oh, I've got to get that better. But I think where I could work on and what I'm trying to do is really build those boundaries and, and recognizing who deserves to yeah. have my energy. Um, and it's, and, and really identifying, I almost feel like I'm very, I like graphs. I like bubbles and, and lines. So I feel like maybe color coordinating, mm -hmm. <laughs> like what, you know, what circle of friends and family fit into this category and like what's next after that and who is next after that. So just really figuring out like not everyone can, um, can receive it because it, it might not always be accepted or um, appreciated the way that it should be. Totally. So that's honestly my biggest, my biggest lesson that I learned from this show, watching myself. And, and maybe just asking more questions too. I think that a lot of the times I was just kind of letting the conversation flow and, and there could have been moments where I could have probed more questions, but it's a lot to digest in that moment that, um, you know, you, you don't get prompted to be like, oh, well, ask this next, you know? So you, you totally. just kind of roll with the conversation as organically as it happens. Yeah, that's a great answer. And you seem like uh, someone who's really embraced this experience as a, a learning opportunity for yourself. So that's, that's awesome. Did you and Raven ever have conversations kind of addressing the way that you were being compared to one another? No, actually, um, we didn't. And I think that whole conversation was just so interesting. Uh, bottom line, it didn't phase me. Like I heard what he said and like, I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. You like a, a very fit girl who's beautiful, and it just was kind of like it went in through one ear and out the other because I'm like, but you have me and this is who I am and this is what I offer. So if you're going to use my looks against me, that's on you, not on me. Um, so I think like I was just throughout the whole process, just very confident on who I was that if someone were to say a comment or two about whatever comparison, like it, it didn't bother me because it, it just for me, like I knew where I was and where I stand. Uh, one more question, and then we'll let you go. How many days do you think it took uh, Bartiz to have sex with another woman after the wedding? <laughs> um, actually, do you guys know the tea? I'd love to hear it from you. 
Well, um, I mean, the very next day, so within 24 hours of our wedding, uh, he reconnected with our castmates and they went out, got like a bottle service somewhere in Dallas. And um, there was a tall blonde in that group, not from our castmates, but castmates bring friends. Sure. And they were very, from what I saw on social media, uh, just from friends posting, I'm like, oh, that's Bartiz. And then another girl close enough to him come to find out that weekend, which was 4th of July weekend. Um, they were on a boat. He was, She was sitting on his lap. I cannot confirm anything about sex because I do not know his sex life. He seemed um, to confirm it me, at the reunion. <laughs> he seemed he seemed to confirm it when he yeah. told people, well, "I loved your." When you were like, "I'm not bringing up sex," <laughs> and he was the only one who brought up sex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just like, "Oh my god!" Like, okay, um, yeah. So I think for me, like that was probably another like. Not only was I blindsided, but then you do this, and I'm like, "Bro, like, really? Like, okay, got it. Understood. Registered. Like, it's a no for me." But he apparently came up with his no right before his no. I don't know. Yeah. Doesn't add yeah. up. Uh, Nancy, I can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, I wish you all the best and uh, all the happiness that, that you deserve. And uh, look forward to watching uh, your your journey as a person and whatever love story you end up. Uh, I lo- we look forward to finding out uh, how this all ends for you. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate all your questions and your time as well. All right. Take care. Bye, Nancy. Thanks. Happy, Bye. Happy birthday. Thank you. 33. There you go. <laughs> Lucky. <laughs> Raven, how's it going? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. So uh, so glad to be talking with you today. Thank you. I'm really excited. Yeah. Uh, we we love you here. We we love a good uh, character arc. We feel like you had the absolute <laughs> best character arc mm-hmm. of the season. I'm curious about how you felt about your portrayal as someone who, yeah. you know, early on got some criticism. Um, I think, you know, you even talked about, you know, like you, you know, you're not just not maybe you're just different than some people. We're all different than all people. But I, I really kind of connected with you on that sense as someone who. Mm-hmm who might be a little bit more, you know, introverted at times or quiet, you know, how did you feel about your representation on the show? Did you like the kind of arc that you had as someone or did did you feel early on that wasn't the most fair representation? Yeah, I think seeing it at first with the rest of the world was hard to watch because I'm like, oh, like, I'm not that negative. Oh, like my facial expressions like are not so aggressive. But I think in a way it does speak to my personality. Like I definitely am more introverted, especially in this group of women. Like I definitely am a little bit on the quiet side. Like I'm a little shy. So it took me a while to like get used to being on camera, being like surrounded by all of these people all the time. So it was definitely hard to watch, but I see myself in it right like i am not like a crazy tv personality i'm definitely like chill go with the flow but it was hard to like get so much criticism but it was a lot of growth (laughs) sure well yeah and i appreciate your willingness to kind of be your most authentic self because while i know it can be hard as someone who's been in your shoes on that end too and and get criticized i know it it can be difficult i think it was great for a lot of people to see i'm i'm guessing there a lot of people saw themselves in you while watching you know and and i feel like for for the more quiet and reserved or even the mo- you know myself a little bit more aloof uh person who like can feel misunderstood at times i feel like yeah. uh you were someone that people probably really connected with and it wouldn't have happened had you not been so kind of authentic to yourself oh my gosh well thank you and that like makes me feel so much better and i hope people could connect with it and i saw like a few people on the internet like you know, you don't know what it's like, like being in front of the camera all the time. And like, no one, I'm not an actress. Like no one tells you like what to do, what to say. So thank you for that. Um, because I am aloof. (laughs) Same girl. Same. Um, uh, what, so you and SK, you guys are still together. I love how I feel like I called that last week, by the way. So suckers. (laughs) I'm I'm talking to Allie and Amanda. Uh, you guys, I was the only one who 
thought they would be together. Well, you named it. I don't think we were like, no, there's no way they're together. You just seemed like a lot of love there. Put it out in the world. We didn't negate it. Like you're looking for an underdog narrative. Yeah. (laughs) No, I think you guys didn't believe in it, or maybe that was Michelle. You're just (laughs) you're putting words in our mouth. Raven and SK. (laughs) You know what, Raven? We love you. (laughs) Anyway, Uh, so how is it going? What's uh, what's are are you? I'm assuming you're still together. Yeah, we're still together. So it's been a while now. Um. Yeah, how and, long? Now? Like, how long has this relationship been going on? Ooh, like over a year. Um, pretty much since filming. After filming, you know, we had a weird space for a while. He, I think, like within that week, um, had to move to California. So we definitely had like a long transition period um, where we like we still talked, but I don't. I think it's been like a little over a year that we were officially like, okay, like you know we're going to be official and move forward um, and kind of pick up where we left off. But there is so much love there. And like, he is literally my best friend. So yeah, we've been making it work between uh, Texas and California. So. That's awesome. A uh, couple questions on that. One, what advice do you have for anyone trying to make a long distance relationship work? Ooh, it, it, it. I think go on love is blind. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, But really, like, what makes it work for us is that we have such a strong foundation that's really, like, based in communication. Mm -hmm. So that, I feel like, is essentially what you need for a long-distance relationship. I trust him so much. And I also know that, like, we have such good communication skills between each other that if something's wrong or someone needs a little bit extra like poured into them or having a rough week like we can be that for each other so i think for me what i have always looked for in a relationship is like a really strong partnership Mm -hmm. you know and we really have that so that's right that's great what is something that you feel like not necessarily um some you guys need to work on but what is something that you as a couple that really communicates very well and what would what would be something you guys would like to, I guess, work on? Because we can always work yeah, on things yeah. to like take your relationship to the next level. Yeah. Like, what, what's a what's totally. something that you guys are actively working on uh, to really advance this relationship? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think because we there's two things, and because we have such gr- uh, great communication, like we talk about them all the time. <laughs> so I hope he doesn't see this, and he's like, "Hey, what the hell." So I would say first is like really getting down how to communicate in each other's love languages specifically. Like for instance, one of mine is like words of affirmation. And so all the time I'm like, I'm so proud of you, babe. Like you the realist, like whatever, like totally like lifting. Like that is just my thing. And he's like, okay, cool. Like, okay. Cause that is not how he receives love. And I'm like, yeah. I just wrote you an entire novel on why you're amazing. And he's like, I don't care. Um, versus his is physical touch. And I'm definitely more just like, not that way. So I think that is one of the ways that we can uh, get a little bit closer and work on our relationship. I love that. though. And and I, I love how you guys are recognizing that l- so much about love language is it isn't just about how you receive love, but how the mm-hmm. other person receives love and that you guys are mindful of that. And I do yes. think that uh, that's great because a lot of so many people hear love languages and they focus on on themselves. themselves. Um, yeah. And that's that is one part of it. But uh, I, I think that's awesome that you guys are doing that. Yeah. Thank you. And of course, like roommate issues, too, because we don't live together 24 seven. So when we do, it's like. You're dirty. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, well, in discussing living situations, um, the conversations that you and SK had about like specifically like dividing rent while he was away yeah. caused quite the stir on the Internet. I, <laughs> and I'm curious if like just kind of now reflecting on that, like if you, there's any context you would add or how you feel about yeah. that conversation. Yeah. So there was a lot like, of course, you can't see the entire conversation. It was like probably an hour long conversation. And we had not talked in depth about like the minute details of him moving, how we're going to split things. Right. And the pods were trying to build a connection as fast as we can. So that was literally one of our first conversations getting into the nitty gritty and you didn't get to see all of it, but I don't know. I'm like, 
maybe it's just me, but I feel like, how do I say this and like not get canceled again? <laughs> like I, if I'm going to get married, don't expect, I want it to be a certain way. Like I just do. I feel like it's a partnership. We're combining everything. And that just wasn't the timing for us financially and with school and stuff like that. So like I said what I said and I'm sticking beside it. <laughs> I, I fucking I fucking love that, Raven, because I think people we, we need to stop apologizing for our our communicating our expectations, whatever those are. I mean, our expectations and what we want in relationships aren't for everyone. That's the whole point. And you having the guts yeah. to communicate that. Um, so that Thank your partner you. has a clear understanding of what you want. And clearly SK is someone who likes this type of energy and likes exactly. to be the, the person who uh, is has great expectations of himself. Like clearly SK yes. is someone who prioritizes rising to the challenge, I think, of, of all yes. things. And so it makes, to, to me, it makes a lot of sense that he fell in love with someone who is very good at communicating heightened expectations, whatever those are. Yeah. And I'm sure there's plenty of men out there that's like, this is not for me, you know? And that's fine. But I, <laughs> I and, and, and that's why, like your character, I like so much because, you know, so much, and we saw this with other couples of of not being clear or, or communicating what they mm -hmm. want for fear of someone saying, well, I don't want that. That's mm -hmm. not for me. And you're someone who seems to to have that be a strength. And even at the risk mm -hmm. of, you know, being criticized or by the internet or things like that. So I, I absolutely love that you did that. Yeah. And like, all I asked for was half of the rent. Like, that's not even crazy. Girl, ask like, whatever you want, you know? Like, like, like again, you're people, not going to get, yeah. you don't get what you don't ask for. So, yeah. you know? I, yeah. yeah. And now you guys are, yeah, I, I couldn't, I think it's incredibly healthy. I mean, it's just, whatever, it's just communication. Uh, like, like you said. Um, do you have any other questions for, for Raven? I'm curious, like, what people might, would be really surprised to know about you. Ooh, I like that question. Um, hmm. I think you guys didn't get to see like a lot of my sense of humor. Like, I think I'm literally a comedian. Like <laughs> I'm hilarious. <laughs> um, so Quick, tell a joke. Like, that is... <laughs> okay. Not on the side. I'm, kidding, I'm, kidding, but, like, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I really am funny. And like, I think that's honestly one of the things that SK likes about me. Um, like we love to laugh. Like, we have the same sense of humor. We love that. And I am definitely like, a funny ass person. What else? I'm like also such an animal girl. And like we did so much animal stuff and filmed it and it and, um, didn't make it in. But like, I feel like that is like a part of like my caring, like softer side. And I guess that part of me didn't really come across, you know, I'm like, I volunteer. I love animals. I love people and I'm funny, but everyone just like thinks I'm so cold. No, it's the, it's the plight of a reality TV star. You never yeah. you never get uh, nuance. You never get nuance yeah. or, or the ability to show yeah, all, people. All, all of who you are. But that's that's what Instagram and TikTok are for. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's why. Like, I literally love TikTok. Like, I think it's so. It's my personality. Like, uh, I know you have to get going, but do you have any final thoughts or or kind of cat, uh, piggybacking on what Amanda had to say about just what you want people to know or learn uh, about your experience and. And what, yeah. what also if there's anything like I know you're saying like obviously you're long distance right now and you're having you sometimes have like roommate difficulties when you get yeah. back together but like if there's like certain things that you really are looking forward to and like your guys's next chapter of life when maybe you can live together and you can like be part of each other's lives on a more daily basis mm -hmm. yeah totally um I think next in our relationship we are moving in together and gonna change locations and probably move um, away from Texas. And I think kind of like having a fresh start together and creating um, like our life from scratch will be really interesting and good for us to like each be able to put in what we want versus like him coming into my space in Dallas and then me going into his space in San Francisco. So I'm really looking forward to that, even though like we have stupid roommate issues, but we get over them. Um, but yeah, learning from my experience, I am like a firm believer that 
dating in the pods, like pod style is so, 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 so good, especially for someone like me who just like my picker was off with men. I think really like being able to connect with a person without distractions, without any like pressures from the real world, really focusing on like what is coming from that person's heart. It's so much easier to like make a decision on them. And it's so much easier to build a connection and answer questions. Like I feel like a lot of times as women, like we're like scared to like ask questions to men that you're dating, you know, like you don't, I don't know. But that's, it just, the pods take all of that away. So I just encourage everyone, like women and men to, you know, challenge themselves to date like that a little bit more. Ask the hard questions, like really, really, really try to get to know someone because a lot of times we we skip parts in the real world, you know? So I think that was really important to me. And like, I learned uh, so, so, so much from that. That's awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you, Raven. Uh, I wish you guys Thank all the you. best. Tell SK we said hello. And uh, I will. we look forward to uh, watching uh, your love story together unfold. Thank you. Thanks for having me, y'all. All right, take care. Bye. Bye. Yeah, bye. 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 What did we think of Bartiz, Nancy, and Raven? What were our takeaways? I mean, the biggest shock to me was the fact that he wasn't intending on sending her that gift. And that gift included a note that basically implied that he was ready to marry her. And Artis, it, was, it was written and sent simply as a response to him receiving a gift from her. I mean, I, I think the biggest takeaway I have of Bertiz is, well, he might mean well, and I, I respect his willingness to take some criticism. And on the reunion, he really, he, he owned it. He owned his mistakes. Um, so you got, you know, credit where credit's due there. It, it, all we can do is get feedback, take it in and and... And learn from it. You know, we'll see if he's willing to learn from it type of thing. But yeah, I think throughout the show itself, I think he just, he really stopped. He's just in his, he's prioritizing his needs before anyone else's, right? And mm-hmm. I think, listen, he's, he's in his mid-20s. Like 20s nowadays uh, are a generally a fairly selfish time in one's life. And in, and for a lot of reasons, I think that's, well, that's I've always said it's time to be selfish too. But part of being in a serious, committed relationship is the ability to put your partner first and their needs first and to empathize and to be able to empathize in the moment without always having to apologize first before you learn how to empathize with someone. Obviously, Nancy seems, that seems to be a strength of, Na- uh, of Nancy's, mm-hmm. almost even to a fault sometimes as she's kind of acknowledged, uh, acknowledged that, you know, she, I think she wants to have that empathy in her relationship. And so... I think we she makes the mistake of doing what a lot of us do is to, you know, she wants to lead by example. So I'm going to be empathetic and I'm going to do all these things and I'm going to be understanding. But the thing about empathy is people usually don't lead by example sometimes, you know. They actually have to like learn the tough lesson. So I think the question for Bertiz is, will he learn from that? Or, you know, because it just comes across as so insensitive. It's totally. very reactionary. He didn't think, well, how is she going to see this? I'm just trying to not look right. like the bad guy in the moment. I basically just gave her yeah. a written near guarantee that I'm going to be saying yes, only to pull the rug out from under her. Sure, yeah. Also, what? does Raven and SK just prove that taking it slow... I mean, it's like some of the stuff we talk about on the show here, like taking it slow, not overcommitting, not jumping into things and thinking everything's perfect, not jumping into saying I love you, having some doubts, getting to know each other. Do they prove that that is the way to go? Because they're still together, doing well. Sure. I mean, I like, there's a lot of things I like about their relationship. And a lot of things, more. I mean, shoot, the way they communicated are more in line with the things that we talk about on the show or things I talked about in my book. Because the kind of the old school approach or the reality TV approach, whether it's the Bachelor of Love is Blind, is to kind of like lean into the passion and lean into like, well, if I made a promise, you know, I called you my boyfriend or girlfriend, I called you my fiance, then I guess I have to, I have to just lean into that. And I can't, I don't want to like ruin a good thing by asking some tough questions and things like that. I love that Nancy kind of acknowledged that going forward, she would like to still maintain that loyalty and that passion, but also be willing to like can, practice more discernment yeah, about who and, gets it. And exactly. Or and, and by doing so, asking more tough questions and checking in and things like that. So I love the the growth from that Nancy displayed. But yeah. And also just giving some props to I think, you know, Colleen and is it Matt? Mm-hmm. You know, in terms of how they're married and yet they don't live together. And I loved Colleen's answer by saying we got married in a very unconventional way. So naturally our relationship is going to be a bit unconventional. I almost kind of like taking a page out of 
SK and, and Raven's book where it's just like, who are we to decide? Like why? Yeah. Like, yeah, they're married. Sure. And I'm not here to say what's healthy or not, but sometimes the challenge of relationships is the pressure we apply to those relationships. Right. We, we will set these kind of artificial like timelines or these, you know, things that, you know, these milestones that we have to get to. And usually when we do that, we're, we're, we're doing it based off of how we think other people do it or how society thinks we should do it, et cetera, et cetera. So to Colleen's point, it would almost seem crazy to meet the way they did and get married in the way they did and then try to have their relationship be like a very traditional, conventional relationship, you know, because all of a sudden that's where the pressures of expectations can come in. It's like, oh, I guess we have to meet all these expectations of relationship standards. And that seems a little bit crazy. So I commend them for for doing that. Will it work out? I don't know. But I think uh, I think it makes a lot of sense for them to be willing to say, oh, hey, they might, we could add more stress by breaking a lease and trying to move in with each other because we think we're supposed to. So let's just be reasonable and say what makes the most sense. Oh, we can still spend most of our time together without living under the same roof, so to speak. We can spend all our time together without living under the same roof. But like, let's not apply unnecessary pressure to ourselves. And I, I thought that was great on both of them. Totally. Because like, especially meeting in like this fairy tale vacuum where there aren't really outside factors of everyday life. It's I think the least thing specifically of being like, I have roommates. I don't want to fuck them over by breaking my lease was like to me just felt so tangible of like, oh, this is such a grounded real world decision. And an example of like, it feels like a kind of they're starting to uh, like go back to the real world in that mm-hmm. choice and like navigating it well. And they also said that like they sleep together seven nights a week or no, not on Mondays to do laundry. So it's like they're still having all of this closeness. And I do think it's a cool thing to be like, you know, when you have an untraditional meeting, like it's you have very expansive opportunities to define what you want your relationship to look like. Yeah. Did you think that Vanessa... It, less so critical, but Vanessa definitely had a ton of follow-up questions over the fact that they weren't living together in kind of a, I don't know, I got a negative. Critical. Yeah. She wasn't my favorite I, host. And I was, I was thinking to myself, you want couples to be successful. If this is what's working and keeping them together, take it, run with it. Don't question that they don't live together. Just accept it and well, move on. I don't think it's Vanessa's priority. I think it may be the sh- like the, her job and the show's priority could be two different things. But I agree. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. Just felt like there was a lot of questions about that when there was a lot of other things to discuss. She, she came off fairly unlikable throughout the entire reunion, I thought. That that was just the standalone moment for me, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know. Other than that. My question is like kind of going back to Raven and SK. Do you think, how do you think having that experience of Raven saying yes and SK saying no, even though ultimately definitely for the better, they're making a really good choice. Like, do you think that's something that will kind of be a seed that's planted in the relationship and emerge later on? Or do you think it's pretty evident that they've been able to navigate it and it's kind of open and shut case? I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. And after talking with Raven, it seems like it only, it, it only becomes an issue if they don't address the issue. You know, if they don't talk about it, if they don't communicate, if they allow their whatever insecurity they could have about that situation, maybe specifically from Raven, if she held on to that insecurity without communicating it and then f- let that fester and then projected her insecurities onto him and then made assumptions about what he might be thinking and feeling, which again, we often do in this relationship. So I don't think it's it would or will. And if it had, I think it already would have. And it sounds like it never really was an issue for them. So yeah, I don't, I don't think it needs to be. I, I will say, going back to Matt and Colleen, though, you know, it's funny because Matt kind of addressed his his reactiveness at the reunion, and I'm glad he he did that. And honestly, I've checked in with some producers I know of from the show, and they ultimately said, think Matt is a good guy. You know, in terms, I think there was a lot of discussions was Matt showing, you know, glimpses of a more serious toxic behavior uh, in terms of his reactiveness. And that was a big discussion point, I think, for a lot of people. I will say I did not like how he articulated it because it almost sounded like he was making an excuse. He answered it by saying, you know, I know I handled this poorly, blah, 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 but it was because of the environment I was in. And I really hated that because it, he was justifying the reactiveness because basically what he said without, I don't think he realized what he was saying, but what to me I took as well, next time in it, I I feel just, you know, next time I'm in a 
I'm caught off guard. Or there are I'm, certain contexts where it's okay yeah, for me to be was, reactive. Exactly. He was basically saying there's certain contexts in which it's okay to be reactive. And I would disagree with that. Mm-hmm. I think true, like, that's the whole idea of not being reactive is to, regardless of the situation, to be able to regulate your emotions and, and learn the steps to, you can get mad. There's nothing wrong with feeling and you're justified with your feelings, but how you handle it in the moment. So you're not someone who always has to apologize after the fact for how you got angry. You know, and I, it seems unclear whether Matt really grasped that, you know, because he was, I understand he was probably feeling defensive, but I failed to, to see a guy who fully grasped that he, he has to, next time that situation comes up, he can't react that way and then keep apologizing for it. And you're not going to have your buddies living down the hall or up on another floor to come and calm you down and tell you to stay engaged, yeah. <laughs> stay married. <laughs> So, you know, whether he has or hasn't, but I just did not like the way he articulated that because it left a seat of doubt for me to know whether he's actually learned that lesson or not. Totally. I did think it was like, I liked that they kind of called out the way like Colleen handled the situation with like Cole and hers exchange versus the way like Cole handled it. I thought it was cool to see the reactions to how differently things played out with Cole and Colleen based on how they what their actions were directly after their conversation. How so? In the sense that, like, Matt acknowledged, like, you know, Colleen, when we watched it back, like, there wasn't, there weren't any surprises. Like, she was very transparent about communicating exactly what had happened. Whereas, I think with Cole, like, and this is probably getting into a much meatier significant discussion topic, but, like, communication was awry with him and Zenob. Oh, yeah. gosh. I think Cole and Zenob are both toxic. I think their relationship was incredibly toxic. And I really struggled with Zenob's lack of accountability for anything she's done. This is not to excuse Cole for anything. Like, you know, I want to, I guess what I'm saying is I want to be able to criticize Zenob without letting Cole off the hook for anything he said or did, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was the problem I had watching the reunion. Wasn't that Cole wasn't, you know, like it was a lot of he said, she said, stuff like this there was you know i you know just because it seemed like everyone was on zenob's side coming from a reality tv background i i don't think the the mob so to speak or the majority is always right i just think uh people are incentivized to agree with the majority so you know i that does i'm saying all I'm saying is I don't know what to believe. I don't really believe either of them. You know what I'm saying? I believe they both showed toxic traits in a relationship. And I guess my biggest cr- criticism of Zenob was absolutely just, it didn't seem like any accountability for that relationship of which we saw toxic traits from both of them. We saw the nitpicking. We saw the, criti- the critiquing of, of Cole while she was while he was cooking and things like that. And that was just a glimpse of something nice he was trying to do. We've we've certainly talked at length of the things that Cole uh, is guilty of uh and how he spoke to her. I think after watching the reunion for me, it became so obvious why those two picked each other in the pods. Tell us. Because I think I think Cole was attracted to Zenob's maturity mm-hmm. and, and almost like in a weird kind of toxic motherly way and i think zena was attracted to cole's immaturity i think zena was attracted to someone that she thought she could control and and yeah kind of mold into what she wanted i think that's what that that's think i think that's what drew uh, each other to one another and i think that's why it didn't ultimately didn't, didn't work out because i just didn't like that zena seemed to want to blame Cole for all the insecurities she's ever had. It, that's how it felt. Was it blaming them for all of them or like blaming him for evoking them, making them more well, that's heightened? What, it didn't seem, that's what, she didn't say that. I mean, you know what I'm saying? She didn't say, hey, I've had some insecurities in the past and you just played into those insecurities and made me feel worse. It was mm-hmm. more like you've never made me feel, no one's ever made me feel like this. You started to make me feel like this. And she she has, she came in with insecurities she left with insecurities. And then again, that's not uh, letting Cole off the hook for anything he's done. It was just more, I just didn't like what seemed to be a pile on. You know, like I thought the proposal was kind of tacky. And I think Cole made a good point. It's just like you, you're saying this for the first time in front of 
our families, that's not a product, that's not communication. That's not creating a safe environment and setting an example of effective communication between two, two people claiming to want to be, two people claiming to be in love and two people claiming to be working towards this goal. That's not what that is. You mean the wedding, not the proposal, right? Like no, them the on wedding. the altar? I'm sorry, the, the mm-hmm. wedding, yeah. And so, yeah, if that was really the first time Cole heard that, it seems disingenuous. It seems performative. It seems like Zeneb was trying to have her deep D moment and not, it wasn't really about standing up for herself. It was about how it came across. That's how it came across to me. I think there's maybe part of the way that I interpreted it was because I think one thing that was pretty central in my interpretation of this was talking about the way like Zeneb and her body image and the way Cole was like discussing food and commenting on hers. And they alluded to the fact that there was a lot of stuff that they didn't air surrounding that. So we just saw kind of the tip of the iceberg. And I think one, I think Cole absolutely like in terms of like who started it. And again, it's like in a relationship, oftentimes it doesn't really matter who started it. It's about who ends it. But I do think it's significant. Like it's not nothing. And I think Cole started that conversation by like using numbers to rate women, putting, giving Zeneb a lower score than one of the other people there. And I think with Zeneb, it was clear that like, to me, it was just like really clear she was like engaging in like disordered eating patterns and kind of like an unhealthy relationship with food that was so fueled by this insecurity, like the flames of which were being fanned by coal. And so I wonder if part of her having it all come like rushing out at the altar was like this kind of like wake up moment. To me, that was not Zenob having some sort of like aha moment in real time. And we just saw her like just speaking from the heart. I think it was all very planned out. You know, from from her saying all the nice things, to all the things that made it look seem like Cole w- was going to get married, you know, ha- that, that she was going to say yes, the prayer and things like that. Like she, she thought about that like anyone would, you know, like you, these people aren't going on TV and just not thinking about they're just not going to be like, I'm just going to like I'm just going to go up there and see what happens. No one's doing that. It's just not realistic as someone who's been in those positions like and and again, like. I want to be very clear, like my criticism of Zeno has nothing to do with not criticizing Cole. I think we can criticize both of them for their behaviors, right? And do you think it's like a Natalie and Shane situation where they bring out the worst in one another? Yeah, one hundred percent. I think yeah. I've never seen two like I think they could not have been more incompatible, Cole and Zeno. Totally. It just doesn't add up to me. You know, it doesn't add up. Like how can how can Zena put all of her insecurities on the blame? Like she it seemed like she was just blaming all in, all of it on Cole. And in to go so far as to you, you're the reason who makes me feel this way. Because her accusations were very strong. And if and if there's any truth behind it, then Cole not only is it, it's not just a guy who's maybe made a mistake or said a wrong thing he needs to apologize for and then learn a tough lesson. We've all said hurtful things to people we say we love. We've all had to apologize for stepping in it or being insensitive or lacking empathy with our partners. We've all done that. And if you can't acknowledge that, then, you know, for anyone listening, then that's a real red flag. So we've all been there. But if and, and the question is, is is Cole someone who is immature and spoiled and selfish and needs to learn how to talk to women or people or have empathy? Or is he literally some sort of emotional abusing monster? I guess what didn't add up is when Cole started crying at the end, Zenob, she literally said, I don't, if I could do it all over again, I would, I would do exactly the same. That doesn't add up for me. Someone who also accused him in front of his family of being the reason why she doesn't have confidence in herself or she doesn't, you know, she has all these, you know, like self doubts as a result of what Cole said to her. And if it really is a result of what Cole said to her, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect her to want to relive that moment exactly as she lived it or experience those things that she experienced with Cole. I think Cole made some valid points at the reunion of like, and again, this is not to take off the hook of anything he said and did, but if it was as bad as she claims, if it was so one-sided, then why, would, then why was she so willing to do these things or even willing at the end to say that she would relive exactly or she has no regrets or she would do exactly the same. I, I just, that doesn't add up to me. And I just wanted Zeneb to take some accountability for her behavior and the role she played in this seemingly mutually toxic relationship. Yeah, because I feel like they just, I mean, I was talking to you guys about this earlier when they were in Malibu and they were spending nights together for the first time. She made some comment or they alluded to her making some comment previously about, oh, when I take my makeup off, I look like a different person or you won't recognize me. And then he made a response comment 
not as if it was new, but it felt like he was building off of her original statement or her observation. I don't know if he was joking. He probably shouldn't have said it whatsoever, but it was just so clear. And then that became a whole thing, but it became a situation where felt like she was trying to pin that whole comment on him and that he was the one to come up with that. So it, it was just two different people. Cause I'm like, you can have someone, if Zenob said, Oh, I look like a completely different person when my makeup's off, she might be looking for him to go, Oh my gosh, of course not. You're beautiful. Da 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 da. But his personality, like partners I've had in the past, might be building off that of either making a joke or being like, Oh wow, you totally do, which some people might find funny and some people might be like, This is great. And other people, it could destroy them. So it's they're just too different. Yeah. I I I think that's a great point. Like their their sense of humor. Yeah. Talking about incompatibility. And I think Zeneb is someone who came in with a lot of insecurities. We all have insecurities. There's nothing wrong with having insecurities. But I think to your point, I think she has been lo- always looking for a partner to make her feel less insecure before she deals with her own insecurities on her own. And I think that plays a role in and how she is in relationships. And I think that plays a role in terms of why she seems to be the type of person who also nitpicks. I mean, again, like these these are two people who picked at each other, you know, and we may I think we saw more of Cole. But I, I think that like that whole cooking episode, I think that is their relationship. I think they both are people who would nitpick at each other, who when they've you know, hurt people, hurt people type of saying when they felt small, they try to make the other piece, person feel small, too. I wonder if. For me, I think part of the reason I identify or like empathize, because I I totally agree that it was like very relational, that there were things that Zenit was doing that were really unhealthy for the dynamic. So I'm like not saying it was one sided. I think for me and wondering why was I so much more inclined to empathize with Zenob, it was kind of because there were almost like more receipts in terms of I interpreted a lot of her behavior as being very overbearing and nitpicky and critical as like somebody who has had to have her shit together for a really long time because of like this sense of like isolation and aloneness of like losing your parents. Like to me, I think so much of the way that she was like a lot of what she was kind of pointing out with Cole was his inability to be an adult the way she thinks an adult should exist. Sure. Which is subjective. Like we can have empathy without giving people an excuse. You know, that's like... By doing like the way you're talking, I just feel like that's like we could say, well, why is Cole the way he is? You know, what what challenges does he face? And I don't think there's an excuse for the way Cole acted. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know how his parents treated him or what he yeah. whatever he fucking went through. I don't know. And it's not to compare what Zenob went through. And I empathize with whatever pain they both experienced. That's not an excuse as bo- they're both adults. One might be older than the other. But if we're going to start making excuses for one, we can't just we can't just make excuses for one party and be like, this is the why of how they this is what they've been through and this is why they reacted the way they did. And that makes it okay. But we're not going to have any empathy for the other party. I was just going to remind everyone that we don't have to have, you know, one perpetrator, one victim, one person's the bad one. And when we're talking about, you know, who has the receipts and who has which reasons, Again, like we talked about with the Natalie and Shane of it all, there's not just like one bad person and one person who's the victim of the other. They both could have contributed to it. They could have both triggered each other. They could have both had shit coming into it. Doesn't excuse anybody, but it also doesn't mean we have to, you know, pound a gavel and say, you're right, you're wrong. I'm with you on that. But that's, well, that's my whole point is being like, why am I more like, like me saying it's very relational. They both have things wrong. So why am I feeling more empathy for Zenob and like analyzing that about like that kind of like bias or that like what I'm coming into this conversation, like valuing. So I'm not trying to say that Cole doesn't deserve empathy. I'm just explaining why for me, Zenob's side like resonated more without saying that it's the only side. Well, I imagine, yeah, I imagine every, you know, all the people watching or gonna identify with certain people and things like that it's just um i would just i would have liked to see more accountability from zenob be- because of how critical she was of cole while cole is very much guilted for his actions i do think she was cruel at times uh, i thought the whole wedding part was unnecessarily cruel in my opinion just watching the show it seemed performative and it seemed to be about her wanting to look good and having her deep D moment, uh, just like we've accused of other people wanting to have their Hannah Brown moment. And I think it didn't land the way she had hoped. And and I think there's criticism to go around for that. And two people can be wrong 
and two people totally. can be wrong, you know, and I just, I'm glad they're not together. Yes. And uh, I hope Cole is is sincere with his apology. Like, and you know, what was interesting with the reunion, I think he was clearly defensive and you have people piling on, but like his kind of apology at the end, it almost seemed like he really, while everyone was talking through the rest of the reunion, he kind of thought about the criticism coming his way. And it seemed like it's sincere. It's just like, well, if I did this to you, I am sorry. I didn't realize. I I'm sorry. I I'm sorry if my words and actions, I think he finally realized the full scope of how it did impact Zenob. And I'm glad he acknowledged that and owned up to that. I just really wish that she would have done a little bit of that as well. Well, one thing I would love for Zenob in the future is like something my therapist says a lot is like people don't make you feel anything. They invite you to feel things. Yeah. And I would love like I think I, I think it's I think it gets more complicated in discussing it in reference to Cole because of course like victim blaming is something like everyone wants to like really tiptoe and be very mindful of. So I think like just it's but it's uncomplicated in saying in the future I would love for Zenob to get to a place where she feels a little bit like she has more autonomy over like the way she's reacting and navigating situations. Um, and like she's a little bit more like self-aware and can make choices that like serve her and the other person better. Yeah, I would agree. Well, I mean, uh, uh, final thoughts on Love is Blind. What a season, uh, I guess, you know. Good season. Good season. Do we think out of the couples, who are we betting on? Who are our, I mean, based on season oh, two, who really I, I knows? I think, uh, I th I think Zenum needs a Brennan in her life. Yeah. Mm. You know, everyone I, needs a. I need a goddamn Brennan. I don't think everyone <laughs> needs a Brennan. I don't. Really? I think, no. I mean, like he seems like a perfect guy for the right for a certain person. You know, but he is there to love and and you know, like I think he he sees himself as someone who just wants to love on their partner. And he receives loves by his ability to give love. I think it's a really selfless, you know, he seems really, I don't know, I, you know, interesting enough, I don't know what Brennan's needs are. He didn't really communicate them all that much other than the desire to want to love somebody. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's all he needs. I don't know. And for some people, that's enough. But I think Zenem needs someone who really is sure about themselves and and so much focus that he just wants to make their their partner feel loved and special and validated. Not everyone's like that. Like a lot of people want to feel that mutually. You know, a lot of uh, I think Zena needs someone in her life who feels a little bit more luckier to have her than she feels to have them. Hmm. And I think other people in relationships, I think like a SK and Raven are people who want that to be mutual. You know, they have equal expectations of each other. They have equal expectations how the other person's supposed to feel and how, they have equal expectations of how lucky they want the other person to feel because I think they're both coming from a place of like confidence and general like security within themselves. Totally. And, and I, open, I just don't see that with Zenob. Yeah, and like I think the open communication was so impressive with Raven and SK. Like the way they navigated at first when it was like sort of, it seemed like they didn't have necessarily the same chemistry that other couples had at the beginning. And like, I just remember the way SK addressed that and like talked about progressing realistically was so emotionally intelligent. One of my favorite things that SK said at the reunion or throughout the entire season is how he pointed out how he quite likes that Raven is hit on or he quite likes that other men are attracted to Raven because, and I, I could not have related more to him in that moment. You know, I don't, the people I date or have been in relationships with, you know, my current, you know, Natalie, like I love that I know that she is sought after and desired and I love that she chooses me. And you can't say that unless you are a self-confident person who's secure in their relationship and or secure attached, if you will. I know we don't, you know, I don't talk about that stuff all that much, but I don't think a Cole or a, a Zenob are capable of having the relationship that Raven and SK have. And I think it's because they both have to truly both work on themselves a lot. And I personally think the SK and Raven type of relationship is the type of relationship I've always desired or wanted to have in my relationship, you know, like long distance, whatever that's, you know, their, their, whatever their current situation is, but how they communicate their style, their trust, because as I like insecure, like jealousy only comes from insecurity, you know, that insecurity either that you bring into the relationship or the insecurity that comes from, you know, Cole and Zena make each other feel more insecure about themselves. Totally. You know, like. It's like an echo chamber. Yeah. You know, like. I'm sure Cole has heard you're immature. I'm, sh you know, I'm, I'm sure Cole has his insecurities. I don't know what they are, and he, I think he masks them with this bravado and, and type of frat boy energy. 
But uh, yeah, and I think if you want to type, have a relationship that SK and, and Raven have, if it comes from yourself first of having that self-confidence and belief in yourself and knowing that your partner is going to choose you and not be you know, so insecure that you need to test your partner, need to test or... them and, and things like that. And um, yeah, so. Totally. We wish them well. Wish I, I like, yeah, I love, uh, I love that for, uh, I really, really like SK and Raven's relationship. Totally. I, I do. And I don't think they got enough credit for, for how healthy it seemed to be. I agree. Anyway. Cheers. Shout out. Well, but wraps up our love is blind discussion. Time for texting office hours. How's it going? Hi there. Hi. My name's Taylor. I'm 23. How can we help Taylor? All right. So I've been talking to a guy who I went on a date with six months ago, and we've kept in touch since. And then we finally just recently hooked up. And now I don't know where to go from here. Okay. Why don't you know where to go from here? In your words. Because we like we don't text. We don't like have any plans to hang out again. So we just talk over Snapchat. But I know that he has a lot of qualities that I'm looking for in someone else. Such as? He is like the funniest person, maybe borderline funniest person I've ever met in my life. Great. I have like a really bold personality and not everyone can handle it, but he can handle it. Okay. Um, so you feel accepted he, by him a little bit? Yeah. I feel like I could tell him my whole life story and he wouldn't judge me. Okay. Um, I'm so curious what you he, mean by bold. Yeah. Bold? Yeah. Um, How have you felt judged by other people you've dated in the past? I'm very outgoing and very blunt. Yeah. So some people, I'm just like a little bit too much for some people. You've been criticized for a lack of filter in the past, maybe? Oh, yeah. I, I don't have a filter, but I've gotten better. Okay. Well, or maybe you don't need to be, get better. Maybe you just need to find people. Yeah. Which one do you think it is? Do you think it's you need to find people who just accept you or do you think... You could work on the filter or a little bit of both. Um, I think people are just a little too sensitive these days. Okay. All right. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> um, and so you said you finally hooked up with him. What how walk us walk us through that love story. Um, okay. So I the week leading up to Halloween weekend, I found out that our worlds were going to like very much collide. Like I knew that my friends were going to show up at the same pregame as his friends. And I knew this the whole week going into it. I just didn't say anything. But I think he found out right before I showed up that I was going because I ended up being like the topic of discussion before the pregame, which I found out through like an inside source. And he was saying that like he's very confused about him and I being together. And at this point, I'm just thinking we're like friends that are like maybe a little like friendlier than a normal friend. So I'm not that confused at this point. But anyways, I walk in. And like, boom, like sparks are flying, like energy's high, a lot of PDA going on here. And then it was really fun. And then I ended up like venturing off doing my own thing. And then next day, I decide to keep the festivities going. Um, and I go to Sunday Fun Day. And I walk into the bar and he's there. And I lock eyes immediately. And this time I actually didn't know he was going to be there. And we hung out like all day. And then Sunday Fun Day turned into like Sunday evening, turned into Sunday night. Um, and I ended up at his house and we were hanging out for a little bit. And then, yeah, I ended up spending the night. But we weren't like drunk or anything Sunday. We were just like having a good time. Uh, and then now I'm confused after that. <laughs> but I know I don't want a situation ship with him. Okay. Or friends with benefits. So have, what have you, have you spoken with him since you guys hooked up? Yeah. Like talking how like we were talking before, like every day, like messaging over Snapchat, stuff like that. Do you like me? I feel like we all think that messaging over Snapchat is a bit of a red flag. Why Why do you feel yeah. like you're only messaging over Snapchat? I don't know. Have you asked? I would text him back if he texted me. Have you stated your expectations in terms of, or your desires in terms of how you would like to communicate with him? No, because I kind of just realized that what they were. Okay. Well, I would start there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you, you think have I should his, text him that? Do you have his number? Yeah. You do have his number. Yeah. All right. Uh, what do we think of her sending him a text that says, going forward, I think this is our should be our main form of communication? I'm all for cutting to the chase, honestly. I feel like, yeah, the talking on Snapchat feels very high school or collegiate to me. I'm not a fan of it. So if he's not down to text, I'd say, boy, bye. Yeah. yeah. I think be, be playful. 
right? I mm-hmm. just think you don't, I don't think you should be like, hey, I was wondering if you would like to like, why don't we text ever? Like, I don't think you should ask him that or, or ask for his permission to do that. I think you should just tell him what you want out of this relationship. So I think you've hooked up with this guy, you're talking with him on a regular basis, a lot of things you like. And I think you stated your desire not to have this be a situationship. That part's yeah. on you. Like it's, it's, you know, situationships happen when we accept less than what we want in a relationship. And often yeah. that happens uh, as a result of not communicating what our expectations of a relationship are to that person. You know, and yeah. because we're like, oh, well, you know, I'm here, I'm hanging out with this funny guy and we finally hooked up and I don't want to ruin like, oh, I don't want to ruin this momentum. So I'm just going to stay quiet with the things that I want and the things that are going to make me happy, et cetera, et cetera. So if you truly don't want this to be a situation ship, which I think is an amazing goal to put out there, I think a lot of people aren't, don't even say that, right? They're not, mm-hmm. they're not even thinking, well, I don't want this to be a situation ship. They're just so afraid of, of, of the situation, the, the situation ending. But to do that, you have to state your expectations with him. Yeah. So I think, what el- what other expectations do you have for a relationship with anyone? So that's like another like internal battle I'm going through because I'm in a very vigorous academic program right now. Okay. And honestly, one reason why I don't think I've been that proactive about the situation is because finding like my guy right now and being in a relationship just isn't my top priority. I mean, if it comes along, like the right person came along, I would make time for them, but it's not like a top priority. But I do know like it's hard to find people who like you are compatible with or could potentially be. So I feel like I would regret not exploring more if I didn't. Is it right person, wrong time? Do we believe in that? No, I don't. Okay. Um, that is... Because I think if it was the right person, it would be the right time. I believe in the fact that you can be attracted to a bunch of different people. And I think a lot of people can you can have chemistry with. And I think there's a lot of people you can be compatible with. And when we interact with those people, we can feel all sorts of different things, many of which we can feel a lot of potential and excitement around. But if the, the wrong time is also just saying, great, but not my person. You know what I'm yeah. saying? That's just like that's just like a convenient way. Uh, I think people, I chalk that up along with the everything happens for a reason. It's just a way to make ourselves feel better about a situation that didn't end up the way we wanted it to, especially yeah. if we're on the like the receiving end of rejection. Oh, is this wrong place, wrong time? Or you know, it just makes ourselves feel better. I I just think it's just oh, that was a person who I had a lot of potential with. That just I also realize that maybe it's not, they're not giving me everything I want or need in a relationship, you know? And so I think you need to decide too. It's just like, what do you want out of this? I think you can be in a very intensive uh, school program. You can have a a job with a lot of responsibility. You can have other priorities and and you have to decide, are you capable of fitting in uh, a romantic relationship that you need to prioritize? And as, and are they capable of being someone who has the self-confidence and the ability to, you know, be a priority, but also support your other priorities, you know? Yeah. So that's another expectation you're going to want to set with someone that you want to have some sort of relationship with. So I guess my first question to you is, do you want a relationship with this guy? Because if you don't want a situationship, does it, does it mean you want a relationship? Because it seems unclear. I would. You would. All right. If like, if like we kept going like how we were and I still liked liked all the qualities that like I found out about him. Like if it still was going really well, I would want it to turn into a relationship. Yeah. So I think step one is for you to state an expectation around how you want to communicate with this guy going forward, which is not on Snapchat. And you can be playful. No. About it. You just say, uh, going forward, I think this is how we should communicate uh, via messages. Like we You can- think that's playful? Well, yeah. I think like, another send a smiley face. Like don't Oh, okay. You know, send a <laughs> You know, to be bossy, but just be like, hey, I think we, if you really want to be playful, like now that we've had sex, I think we can progress yeah, to that like text would, I think messaging. that's actually more fun than your first draft. Well, sure. I like that. Yeah, I would want it to be fun. Now yeah. that we've fucked, I feel like we can. <laughs> let's, let's upgrade. <laughs> let's upgrade to text messaging. Let's graduate. I let's also, graduate to text messaging. I also think like if he Snapchats you, like if he snaps you, you can just respond to his snap via text and then acknowledge it there. If you feel weird, like texting out of the book. Oh, that would be funny. I mean, you've had sex with them. You've seen each other naked. Let's Let's why? Let's not make texting such a big step or big milestone in this 
and this connection. Yeah. I think yeah, if right. you can't state that you would rather text message via Snapchat, then we're not where we need to be. Okay. So yeah, you're probably right. let's not tiptoe around that. Let's just put that out there. And you could be playful. And if he does, yeah, I would have to be play- Like, I want to, like, grab his attention. Now that we've seen each other naked, I think we can graduate to text messaging. See what he says. Yeah, that's fun. Okay, or you could even, we could even, we could do a hybrid. We could well, do you a don't hybrid. Think he'll, if he doesn't answer, then you have an answer. What okay, if you do a hybrid? Rejection, if, rejection. If he messages you on Snapchat, send two, respond to it, and then in parentheses say, now that we've seen each other naked, I think we can graduate to text. Yeah. So it's not just like, like complete, text that to him. Yeah, so yeah. if he texts you, like, oh, like, I'm on my way to dinner at such and such place, be like, let me know how that place is. In next text, in parentheses, now that we've seen each other naked, I think that we can upgrade a text. Like, respond to it in text because it gives him no, something to respond to. But then what is he going to say? Hey. I think she should literally send him a text right now and just say, now that we've <laughs> seen each other naked, I think we should graduate to text messaging. Why do we have to, like, wait for some setup? You know, like this is not like someone who's shooting their shot with a stranger or or that's the whole point of the text. We've now that we've seen each other naked, I think, you know, to your point, like I think the Snapchatting is a little silly and ridiculous. And why has that become such an acceptable form of communication to the point in which you're ner- the fact that you're nervous about this is silly. Mm-hmm. I don't think yeah, you're silly, it is. but it, it is silly. So let's not. I think it makes it even more silly for us to try to tiptoe around how do we shoot our shot? Just just do normalize text messaging by just making it seem normal and be playful about it. And if if okay. if he's if he has a barrier, if he's resistant to it, then that's a red flag. Why? Immediately Why? if he, if he's yeah. like if he gives you resistant, I think it's acceptable for you to be like, well, "Why are you so resistant to this?" I think if he didn't answer, I would just cut him off completely, like all communication. You're going to, that, why? <laughs> like, because if he doesn't answer that text that I sent him, I wouldn't answer him anymore. Well, because... I love that you're setting, yeah, sure, that's you just enforcing a boundary. I, yeah. I agree with you. Don't, once you say that, don't respond to him via Snap anymore until he makes texting the primary uh, communication. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. But if this someone who you've progressed and gotten to know, like, don't don't ghost him, you know? Like, at, yeah, listen, if he, do you really think there's a chance he's never going to text you? No, he he might answer. He might. Why? 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 I'm curious. What makes you think he's so unlikely? Why? Why are you so worried that he might not? I I feel like I've texted him in the past and he hasn't answered. But very sporadically. Like, I think I asked him to, like, meet me somewhere. Like, my friends at, like, a bar. And he didn't answer. Or maybe I called him randomly and he didn't answer. I don't know. All right. Well, let's let's get an answer. It's not a weird thing. And that's what you have to remember, that texting is not weird. What's weird is to only Snapchat. So, like, you're not the weird one for wanting this. So okay. you should, if it's, not, if it's normal, then you shouldn't have to explain yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, so don't feel like you need to justify why you need to do this. It's just you, you, you have the right to be like, why don't you want to do this? Okay. If it's it's weird not to be willing to text. I yeah, I think it's weird too. So and like, I don't that, like just Snapchat. know that you should like anytime you feel like you you shouldn't be the one who have to explain yourself in this in this thing. It's it would that would be him. Okay. And then assuming he responds, I think then maybe ask him out on a date. And then on the date, I think you should try to define the relationship a little bit more. Doesn't mean you have to call him your boyfriend or girlfriend, but defining the relationship isn't just about titles. It's about resetting and setting expectations or setting or resetting expectations if you want to go in order, so to speak. So those expectations yeah. you could set would be something like, well, I mean, I really enjoyed getting to know you. Obviously, I had fun last night. I want to keep getting to know you more. And I love, I, I want to progress things and like I want to keep getting to know you more and I'd I'd like to see where this can go put some sort of goal attached to it you know or or, you know what do you want from this do you want to set expectations around being exclusive with one another now that you've you know do you want to keep having sex with him do I yeah oh yeah and if you keep having sex with him do you want him to not have sex with other people 
I definitely wouldn't want to know about it if he was. And is that what you really want or is that what you're willing to accept? Because there's a difference. And if someone, if for someone who says they don't want to get in a situation ship, you need to be very careful uh, uh, and know the difference between being willing to accept something and stating an expectation. Because I think a lot of people in your shoes start just figuring out what they're willing to accept, which goes against what they really want, right? Yeah. Because I was like, oh, do you want to have him stop sleeping with other people? And you answer that by saying what, what you would be willing to accept, which is clearly not what you want. To me, That's what it sounds mm -hmm. like to me. Because what, what would you want? If you got to call the shots, would what you want, would what, is, is all you want is to not hear about it? Or would you just rather have him not sleep with other people while you guys are having sex? Yeah, probably not. Especially if we were like hanging out more regularly too. Yeah. If it became more regular. So I would love for you to maybe give it some real thought. Even writing it down, I think would be a good exercise for you. What are what do I want from this? Let, realistically, you know? And and, mm -hmm. and don't forget about what he wants. Don't forget about what you think he's going to be okay with. Just put out what you want. You know, that, okay. once you state your expectations with him, he might rebuttal and say, well, this is why I don't want, uh, this is why it might be hard for me to meet that expectation. And then you guys can discuss and figure out whether there's a match there. But let's, before you start, you know, renegotiating with yourself, just write down what you want, right? Mm -hmm. And then s communicate that. Send that text. Let's just send it right, right now. Right now? Why not? It's That's so time. wild. But you're in the company of friends. You'll He's never feel more confident than you do in this moment. <laughs> Literally seeing you naked. I feel like... Do you guess. guys think I should send it right now? Why not? Yeah. Who is this but person we're so afraid of texting? <laughs> um, okay. If he's that wait. easy to spook, you don't really yeah. need him. Okay, wait, what am I saying? Now that we've seen each, each other, other naked, naked, I, I think we should graduate. Wait, it's a text message. Okay, I'm sending it. Amazing. <gasps> <laughs> It was like a golf Ooh, clap. That's, that's so scary. Oh, yeah. Now okay. so uh, let us know uh, if he responds at all, and uh -huh. then but promise me if he does respond, I you know be playful, but ask him on a date next time. Like say like I'd like to, let's when are we hanging out again? Okay, and, just say something like that. Yeah, let, I'd love to see you again. Be assertive. Tell uh -huh. him what you want. Take take charge of this. You know, uh -huh. you know what you want, so go get what you want and communicate it. And next time you sit down with them face to face, then that's when you, I think you should communicate some more expectations. And it seems uh -huh. like from hearing from you that your expectations are to communicate that you would like to progress, you would like to continue what you're doing, but advancing it by setting some more clear expectations around if we're going to keep hooking up, I want it to be exclusive. And if he, if he gives you the, oh, I'm not looking for a relationship right now, then you have your answer. Because you are, because you just said, yeah. I don't want a real situationship. And then you say, well, I don't want a situationship. So I think we just are going to have to end it. Yeah. Like I have good intentions. So yeah. if he doesn't, then like I have no desire to keep calling. And, and he has the right to say no. Right. Yeah. But yeah. don't re don't renegotiate with yourself. Don't reevaluate your expectations just because your expectations aren't met. Okay. 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 All right. We'll keep us posted. Good luck. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. -bye. Good luck. Bye. Well, thanks for listening, guys. I hope you enjoyed our 500th episode as much as we enjoyed giving it to you. Once again, can't thank you all enough for being a part of this journey. Whatever, however many episodes you listen to, I know there's so many of you out there who have listened to every single one. So many of you have come up to me and told me that. I appreciate it. It's always been very meaningful. People come up to me and, and, and share that they listen to the show and podcast. So if you ever see me out there, don't be afraid to do that. Uh, say hi. Uh, thanks, everyone who's ever listened. Don't forget to tell your friends. Uh, for all you Ask Nick listeners out there, uh, don't forget to tell your guy friends about this, all the guys who are you know, your brothers or your guy friends who are struggling in relationships. If uh, you are uh, know of a friend or if you're in a situation yourself and you want to see if you can kind of shit or get off the pot, have, how about you both come on an Ask Nick episode? We'd love to, to hear those stories. I, I would love to have two people in a situation come on an Ask Nick and figure out if we can turn this into a relationship or if we can just maybe stop wasting each other's time. That would be awesome. Uh, again, uh, Jason Nash next week. Also, we'll be talking with a uh, diagnosed sociopath. And if you want to meet other singles or people dating or people who listen to the show or read Nick's book in your area, make sure to find your local Don't Text Your Ex Happy Birthday book club on our Instagram, or you can search for them on Facebook. All right. Keep your eyes out tomorrow for an extra special new segment yeah, about 
breakup songs. Ooh. Oh yeah, that's right. And our yeah, our our uh, uh, installment number three of the update episode drops tomorrow, so don't miss that. So uh, yeah, we work hard, so you don't have to. All right, I think that's it. Well, happy 500th episode to everyone. <laughs> Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Hey guys, thanks for watching, but before you go, make sure you like, subscribe, and ring that bell so you don't miss any future videos like our Monday's Ask Nick for your favorite relationship stories and advice, and our Tuesday Bachelor Recaps. See you next time.